I have just started the recording for this meeting, just to let you all know that this meeting is being recorded. Um, all of the meetings are recorded and then posted to YouTube and they're associated on the PNT's webpage. So you can go um, check out uh, the events uh, after the fact. So with that, um, welcome to the October PNT meeting. We're gonna start off with roll call introductions. Uh, on the screen, we have the PNT committee members, the seat that they fill, and their expiration date. And we'll just start alphabetically. So, Pat, if you'll lead us off. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Pat T. Martino, I'm a pediatrician and hemonc doc at uh, OHSU, where I'm faculty. Kat, where are you? I know you can't see the screen yet. Driving, you might have a uh, difficulty introducing yourself as well. So Kat Livingston is one of the physicians on the committee. Her term expires at the end of this year. She is a medical director with HealthShare. So thank you for joining us, Kat. Thanks. State. I heard you. Sorry, I talked over the, talked over the top of you. Uh, Stacy Ramirez is not able to join us today. So Tim, we'll go to you. Hello, I'm Tim Langford, I'm pharmacy director at Island Tribal Health in Chilton, Oregon. And happy to be here today. Welcome, thank you. Karen. Hi, this is Karen Michelson. I'm the pharmacy director for the Coquel Indian Tribe in Coos Bay, Oregon. Welcome, Karen. I'm expecting Robin will be joining us. I haven't seen her yet. I'm checking, there's a lot of people on your site so to scroll to find her. Um, and I appreciate my team if you see people's names pop up help direct me to them, but I don't see her. So let's move on. Uh, Bill, we'll go to you and you're chairing, we're serving as our chair today. I think you might still be on mute. Trying to negotiate three screens here. <clears throat> Understood, we got you now. Bill Origer, family practice, residency faculty of the uh, Family Medicine Residency of Samaritan Corvallis. Welcome, Bill, and apologies that I didn't update the agenda to uh, reflect that you are serving as our chair today, but do appreciate you stepping in, thank you. Mark Helm is not able to join us today. I uh, just heard from Russ as well, he couldn't join us. So Eddie, we'll turn it over to you. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, Eddie Saito, Associate Professor with uh, Pacific University School of Pharmacy and uh, Clinical Pharmacist with Virginia Garcia Memorial Health Center in Cornelius. Welcome, thank you. So we do have our six members, so we have a quorum so we can conduct business on behalf of the OHA to make recommendations. Again, I'm ex hoping and expecting um, Robin's able to join us. We'll have her introduce if and when she does. Um, Jennifer, I don't know if I saw you joining us today. So I'm Roger Citrin. Uh, I'm the director of the Drug Use Research and Management Program. We provide uh, pharmacy consultation to the OHA. Trevor? We had Trevor and- How about now, can you hear me? Now we got you. All right. Well, thank you. All of us, okay, all of a sudden my screen, can you still hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. I'm gonna try back, logging back in. I, I think you said uh, you can hear me. I'm, we I'm can hear my... you, Trevor, but go ahead and introduce and then log back okay. in. Trevor Douglas, OPDP and Pharmacy Purchasing Director for OHA. Thank you. We'll pay attention when you join back in. Hi, Dave, I'm Dave. Trevor. Thank yeah, you. Dave Engen, uh, clinical pharmacist with the OSU Durham team. I'm Sarah Fletcher. I'm one of the pharmacy and therapeutics clinical coordinators with the Durham team. Andrew isn't able to join us today. Kyle, turn it over to you. Hi there. My name is Kyle Hamilton. I'm the pharmacy drug coordinator and I work with OHA. Megan, as well, uh, isn't with us today. Um, so, Deanna. Hi, I'm Deanna Moretz. I am uh, one of the pharmacists with the Drug Use Research Management Team through the OSU College of Pharmacy. Excellent. No Amanda today, so Kathy Centena. 
Great. Yeah. So I'm a clinical pharmacist with the Derm Group as well, and happy to be here. And my name is Sarah Servid. I work with Sarah Fletcher as a clinical coordinator with the OSU Derm Group. I'm Lan Starkweather. I'm the pharmacy manager for Gainwell Technologies. Uh, no D. Weston today. Uh, Brandon, I don't know if I saw you jump on board yet. Yep, I'm here. Uh, Brandon Wells, Pharmacy Program Analyst for the Fee for Service Program at OHA. And I'm Ted Williams, a clinical pharmacist with the Derm Group. Excellent. Thank you all. Um, with that, uh, we have, um, first of all, the approval of the agenda. I wanted to make one minor modification today. Uh, as part of the consent agenda, we had the anti-epileptic class update and new drug evaluation. Uh, in light of the fact that we need to present and propose some potential PA criteria, uh, we are going to remove the anti-epileptic class update new drug evaluation from the consent agenda, and we'll treat that as the top of the order business under a preferred new drug list business. And then no other changes uh, are recommended. I guess, let me ask the committee if there's any consent agenda topics uh, in addition to that that you'd like to discuss or if you're fine leaving those uh, as consent agenda topics. Hearing none, we'll proceed as written with that minor modification. So conflict of interest declaration, um, as we always point out, conflict of interest is vitally important to be disclosed to the OHA and to the committee. Uh, all committee members and staff have a current conflict of interest declaration form on file with the OHA. Anybody wishing to provide public comment or submit comments for consideration by the committee are also required to fill out our conflict of interest declaration. Uh, nonetheless, we do at the top of each meeting provide an opportunity for any of the committee members to disclose any new conflicts which haven't been brought to the attention of the OHA. And so at this point, um, we'll see if any committee members need to recuse themselves from any topics or have any new conflicts of interest they need to disclose. Great. Again, hearing none, we'll move on. So we have the approval of the minutes. I sent out the minutes from the last PNT meeting in August out to the committee so you could review those in advance. If you're uh, following along on the packet that's posted to our website, um, we're on page four, but again, just a reminder, we do post all of our materials to our website where you found the link to this meeting and the full packet of materials is there. So we're on page four if you're following along. So it's up to the committee if you have any edits for us for those minutes, or if not, we need a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Thanks, Eddie. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Bill. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? And anyone abstain? Great. We'll approve the minutes. Uh, with that, we'll turn it back over to Trevor for department update. I think I'm back now. So um, we can hear you and see you. Perfect. Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much, committee members, for your dedication and time um, and continued uh, commitment to this important work. And I also um, always forget to just also thank Roger and his team. They do an amazing job in supporting you all, and, and I, I want to make sure that they're also thanked. I do have one uh, department update that is of importance. Um, many of you may be aware that Jeremy Van de Hey, uh, the director, former director of HPA, is no longer with OHA. He has moved on to another employer. And we, with that, we now have an interim director of the Health Policy and Analytics Division, and his name is Ali Hassoun. He will be serving on an interim basis, um, and I think also continuing to do his other job, which is the director of OEB and PEB. So I just thought that would be of interest to some of you. With that, I will turn it back to you all. Thank you, Trevor. Any questions for Trevor or the department? All right, appreciate it. 
So we're moving on to the consent agenda. Uh, we have three topics that are part of that. Uh, the TIMS, page eight, uh, colony stimulating, page 47, and the annual report, which is posted independently from the packet. Um, haven't heard that anybody wishes to pull those off. So need a, post a motion to approve the recommendations in the consent agenda. Um, and we will be reviewing some of these topics in exec session, so bring those back. But at this point, the clinical recommendations, motion to approve. Motion to approve. Great, thank you, Ed. Do we have a second? Second. Ed. Great, thank you, Eddie. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Or abstain? Excellent. Uh, consent agenda topics are approved. With that, as I mentioned at the top of the order, we are pulling the anti-epileptic class update and new drug evaluation off and we'll be presenting it. Um, so I think we're gonna pull up some criteria and or the report, uh, page 52, if you're following along in the packet and we'll turn it over to Sarah Fletcher. Thanks, Roger. Um, yes, we just wanted to make a couple of changes to some of the recommendations on this, and that's why we are pulling it off of the consent agenda. Um, I did a class update, and you can see the conclusions on the page. Most of the information was based off of one of the NICE updates that um, did not really substantially require any changes to any of our existing criteria, and so I don't have any recommendations for that. But there is a new drug evaluation contained in this, and that is for um, something called Zetalmi or Ganaxalone. Um, and it is for cyclin dependent kinase like 5 deficiency disorder. And a little bit of background about that disorder, it is, um, it usually presents with seizures before three months of age, about 90% of patients present before their three months of age. And they're often very refractory. And so patients can go through many, many different treatments. Um, there was one trial that was used for the approval of this medication. And it was um, studying patients who were at least two years of age and who had failed um, multiple therapies, and they were taking up to four other anti-epileptic medications. Uh, they were titrated up with the medication of um, Zetalmi, and then you can see at the end of the trial period, they had a median change of about 30% reduction in seizure frequency compared to, compared to placebo. Uh, we'd originally made a recommendation to make this non-preferred and just restrict it to the non-preferred drug PA, but it's actually a carve-out medication. And so we wanna change that recommendation to be voluntary non-preferred and um, put in a safety edit that just holds it to indication and appropriate dosing. Um, the other recommendations we have are remaining the same, and we would still like to review the cost in executive session. And Sarah, if you could switch to the safety edit, if you have that, so they can see that on the screen. So you can see it's just restricting it to the diagnosis, to the diagnosis with it, which is CDD for patients age two years and above, and then um, confirming that the weight is appropriate for the dose. Because this medication can cause some abrupt seizure withdrawal if you stop it quickly, if someone were to come in on it um, and maybe not these, meet these criteria, we wanted to send it to medical director review to make sure that there was no abrupt discontinuation um, to cause any other additional problems. And so that is actually all I wanted to present with this. And I know if you have any other questions, please let me know. And then we have several public commenters as well. Thank you, Sarah. Any questions for Sarah before we entertain our public comment? Okay. Uh, Dr. John Flatt, uh, I've made you a co-host. You should be able to unmute your phone. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you okay. Um, so uh, conflict of interest was submitted. You work for um, Marinas Pharmaceuticals, the manufacturer of Zetalmi. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yes, Marinas Pharmaceuticals, yes. Awesome. Well, we provide up to three minutes uh, for public comment. I am gonna pull up a timer in just a moment to share my screen, uh, but the floor is yours to address the committee. Thank you, I appreciate it. And thank you for the time uh, here and share this information today. So Zetalmi itself was approved by the FDA back on March 18th of this year as the first and only indicated treatment for seizures associated with CDKL5 deficiency disorder, or CDD, patients two years of age and older. Zetalmi is the first neuroactive steroid anticonvulsant and classified as a Schedule V controlled substance by the DEA. 
So Tommy works as a positive allosteric modulator of GABA-A receptors located in the central nervous system. It binds to a unique site on GABA-A receptors present on both synaptic and extrasynaptic receptors, enhancing GABAergic tone, and provides a distinct mechanism of action for other anti-anti-seizure medications. The precise mechanism at which it exerts its anticonvulsant effects and seizures is associated with CD is unknown. Zotomy is supplied as an oral suspension, administered three times daily with food. The recommended dosing for Zotomy is weight-based, up to 28 kilograms, and includes a weekly titration schedule until a goal dose has been achieved or is tolerated. CDD in itself is a rare genetic infantile onset developmental epileptic encephalopathy caused by mutation in the cyclin-dependent kinase-like 5 gene located on the X chromosome. It encodes proteins essential for normal brain function. The incidence is approximately 1 in 40,000 live births, affecting females four times more often than males. A diagnosis of CDD is accomplished through the genetic testing to determine the presence of a pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant in the CDKL5 gene. CDD is characterized by an early onset difficult to control seizures and is accompanied by severe developmental delay and intellectual disability. As previously noted, CDD associated seizures begin early in life with a median onset around six weeks of age. 90% of patients experience seizures within the first three months of life and 97% experience seizures within the first six months. In addition, 80% of patients experience daily seizures with 20% of patients experiencing weekly to monthly seizures. The types of seizures associated with CDD are diverse, and patients often experience multiple seizure types over time. The safety and efficacy of Zotomy was assessed in the Marigold study, a global double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trial evaluating the percent change in 28-day major motor seizure frequency in a double-blind phase relative to baseline. Enrolled participants with CDD had previously received a mean of seven anti-seizure medications and were on a mean of two concomitant anti-seizure medications. The baseline median 28-day major motor seizure frequency was 49 per 28 days in the placebo group and 54 per 28 days in the Zotomy group. In this clinical study of 101 children and young adults aged 2 to 19, Zotomy significantly reduced the frequency of monthly major motor seizures associated with CDD by 31% compared to 7% with placebo. In the Marigold study, Zotomy was well tolerated. The most common adverse reactions included somnolence at 38%, pyrexia 18%, salivary hypersecretion, and seasonal allergy at 6%. In closing, Zotomy is the first and only FDA-approved treatment specifically for seizures associated with CDKL5 deficiency disorder in patients two years of age and older. Zotomy fills an unmet clinical need for the treatment of CDD-associated seizures, which are highly refractory to currently available anti-seizure medications. Great. Thank you, Dr. Flatt. Uh, any questions from the committee for Dr. Flatt? Okay, thank you. Thank you. And you bet. Next, we have uh, Troy Whitworth uh, with Norellis Incorporated. Uh, wanted to speak on behalf of the manufacturer of Veltalco. Uh, Troy, are you able to unmute your line? Uh, yes, I am. Can you hear me fine? Hear you loud and clear? Fantastic. And with that, the right, floor my, is yours. Thank you. My name is Troy Whitworth. I'm a medical science liaison, Department of Clinical Development and Medical Affairs at Norellis. We request Veltalco be placed in preferred position without restrictions. Valtoco is an intranasal diazepam formulation for emergency rescue treatment of seizure clusters, and it's the first and only intranasal rescue medication for patients with epilepsy six years and older. There is currently a clinical trial in children aged two to five to investigate the safety and pharmacokinetics of Valtoco for this population. The efficacy of Valtoco is based on the relative bioavailability compared to diazepam rectal gel. Both medications have the same active ingredient, diazepam, whose efficacy in seizure clusters has been established through clinical trials. The FDA designated Valtoco clinically superior diastat due to the contribution of patient care. Seizure clusters are commonly defined as two or more seizures within a 24-hour period. When treating these seizure clusters with rescue medications, the primary goals are to stop the initial seizure and prevent reoccurrence of seizure activity over time. In a recent analysis of patient diaries, it was shown that a majority of the seizure events within the cluster itself tend to occur between 6 to 24 hours after the initial presenting seizure. The half-life of Altoco is 49.2 hours, which would allow coverage over the expected 24-hour time frame. Altoco dosi dosing is based tailored to patients' age and weight with 5, 10, 15, and 20 milligram doses available. 
and pharmacokinetic studies demonstrated consistent and reliable dosing with 97% bioavailability of diazepam relative to IV. When compared to diastat, the pharmacokinetic parameters of Valtoco were two to four, fourfold less variable. The clinical development program consisted of five studies, including long-term safety study. The safety findings were consistent with what is known for diazepam with a rate of somnolence of 1.8%. In exploratory analysis from long-term safety study, patients and the caregivers reported rapid Valtoco administration and seizure cessation. The median time to administration was two minutes, resulting in a median time to cessation of four minutes. Another exploratory analysis demonstrated that in nearly 4,000 seizure cluster events treated with Valtoco, 87% of these events were managed by a single dose over a 24 hour period. Like all benzodiazepines, Valtoco has a boxed warning regarding concomitant use with opioids, abuse, misuse, and addiction, as well as potential for dependence and withdrawal reactions. The most common local AEs were nasal discomfort, epistasis, and dyskusia. If you would like additional safety information, please consult the full prescribing information for Valtoco. So in summary, Valtoco provides a non-invasive on-hand rescue treatment for these seizure emergencies and is the only rescue medication nasal spray indicated for patients six and above. Valtoco is designated clinically superior to diastat by the FDA, granting it orphan drug exclusivity. The availability of rescue medications easily administered at home or out of the hospital have the potential to decrease unnecessary utilization of healthcare resources, break the cycle of seizures, and prevent progression to status epilepticus. And I'll be happy to entertain any questions you might have. Thank you, Troy. Any questions for Troy? Okay, thank you. Um, so we have the recommendations back up on the screen in front of you. We're recommending maintaining uh, Ganaxalone as on the voluntary non-preferred um, and implementing the safety edit that Sarah went over. We can bring that up again. Uh, changing the class name to the outpatient anti-epileptics and to include the new auto injector for midazolam. No other changes. We will review this in executive session. Roger, just a quick question. Could you remind us how a voluntary non-preferred differs from anything else non-preferred needing a PA? Yeah, so in the physical health drugs where it's actually designated as non-preferred, that would stop for prior authorization just simply by being non-preferred, um, unless drugs have clinical criteria. In the case of the carve-out medications that are paid by fee-for-service, uh, uh, we, we don't have the authority to stop a drug for PDL status exclusively to try to drive utilization based on being preferred or non-preferred. So it's called voluntary non-preferred, um, but we still can have and stop it for PA for... Uh, clinical reasons for utilization controls. Totally. Thank you. You bet. I just have a question about, um, you know, it looks like it was studied as an add-on therapy for resistant um, seizures. And I'm just wondering if the, the draft PA criteria captures um, that particular, those indications as well. We, um, yes, that's a great question, and we've talked about that a little bit internally. Because this is such a refractory seizure disorder that presents so early with most of these patients, and the, so before three months, about 90% of them already begin having seizures. By the time you get to the two-year mark where the FDA indication starts, it was almost assured that the patients would have already stepped through multiple therapies, and so we thought that that would be more streamlined to leave that out, but happy to hear other other thoughts if you feel strongly that we should add that. So I, I'm just a little bit confused. Is there a PA criteria? What we're recommending is um, a safety edit, which functions to stop it in similar ways as a prior authorization because it's a voluntary non-preferred and this one would just stop it for diagnosis and appropriate weight. Gotcha, thank you. Mm -hmm. Kat, did I answer your question? That made sense. Okay, any other questions or comments? Then we'd entertain a motion to approve the recommendations. So moved. Second. 
All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Any abstain? Great, the recommendations pass. So we'll continue on. We'll back to the agenda as previously printed. The multiple sclerosis uh, class update. Direct your attention to page 85 if you're following along in the packet. And we'll turn it over to Deanna. Thanks, Roger. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so just to orient you, the last time we talked about the MS drugs was uh, June of 2021. Uh, if you're interested which drugs we're talking about, there is a table on page 89 that summarizes all the different medications that are approved for MS. The PDL status for the MS drugs are listed in Appendix 1, which is on uh, page 102. Our current policy is to prefer glutiramir and interferon products and not require prior authorization. PA is required for all the oral medications used to treat MS as well as ocrelizumab and natalizumab, which are uh, physician administered drugs in a healthcare setting. And then we also require uh, PA for PEG interferon and ofatuumab, which uh, both of those can be self-injected. And then finally, the PA criteria is on uh, page 105 if you wanna take a look at that. So the purpose of this class up update was to see if there was any new comparative evidence for the disease modifying drugs for MS that have been published since 2021. And there's a typo on there. It should be disease, not diseased. Um, there are four high quality systematic reviews that have been published since last year. And then we have uh, four different guidelines from NICE and two from CADF. So next slide, please. So there were two Cochrane reviews. Uh, the first one in 2022 looked at ocrelizumab and uh, the reviewers looked at both of the indications for ocrelizumab. Ocrelizumab is the only MS drug that has the FDA approval to use in primary progressive MS. And uh, it's also approved for relapsing remitting uh, uh, forms of MS. So uh, most of the studies compared uh, in relapsing forms of MS compared ocrelizumab with interferon, and they found uh, from their meta-analysis that ocrelizumab probably results in a reduction in relapse rate, but no difference in adverse effects when compared to interferon at 96 weeks, and that was based on moderate uh, certainty ev evidence. For primary progressive MS, because there are no other approved drugs, the comparison was placebo and ocrelizumab did show a reduction in disability progression and no difference in serious adverse effects or people opting out of treatment caused by adverse effects compared to placebo and that was low certainty evidence. And then, um, the other Cochrane review looked at saponamide for patients uh, diagnosed with evidence, uh, uh, diagnosed with uh, MS. And the Cochrane review found there's low certainty evidence that supports the use of saponamide uh, when compared to placebo to reduce the annualized relapse rate and improve worsening of disability at six months. Next slide, please. And there was two other systematic reviews looking at adverse effects. Um, the uh, S1P receptor mod modulators are, are all oral medications. And uh, we're seeing um, evolving therapies come in this class. And a lot of times it's um, trying to make the newer agents um, less, uh, have less of an impact on cardiovascular adverse effects because that's the biggest side effect of this class of drugs. So this systematic review was looking at the risk of cardiovascular events and um, they found that uh, there is a higher risk of cardiovascular adverse events with the S1P receptor modulators compared to the control group. And then the other systematic review uh, looked at the risk of infection when people are treated with fingolimod, another oral MS drug. And compared to the controls, which were placebo, interferon, glutiramir, and uh, natalizumab, fing fingolamide did have uh, increased risk of infection, and that was moderate quality evidence. Next slide, please. So in terms of guidelines, uh, NICE has been um, looking at each one of the newer drugs uh, individually and coming up with guidance. 
So for duroxamal uh, fumarate, uh, NICE recommended that be first line uh, as a first line option for adults with um, active relapsing forms of MS. Uh, and active is defined as two clinically significant relapses in the previous two years if they do not have highly active or rapidly evolving severe uh, relapsing remitting MS. And the reason that NICE put that um, caveat in is because there is uh, no evidence for using duroxamel in patients that have severe MS or MS that's rapidly evolving. Uh, NICE also looked at panisamide for treating relapsing forms of MS and uh, decided that uh, compared to teraflumide, that uh, panisamide uh, showed promising results and that people had fewer relapses with panisamide than they did with teraflunide. Next slide, please. Kenneth and Nice um, had some over um, some uh, refer some recommendations that overlapped. So uh, first, Nice looked at ofatuumab, which is our latest drug that we reviewed last year um, as an option for treating relapsing forms of MS um, with active disease. And uh, when compared to teraflunamide in clinical trials. Uh, there was good evidence that ofatuumab reduced the number of relapses and slowed degree, uh, disease progression. Um, Cadith also looked at ofatuumab and they had similar recommendations, but they did suggest in their criteria that um, ofatuumab be used in patients that had an expanded disability status score of less than six and evidence of active disease. Both NICE and Cadith looked at ozonamab for using that in relapsing forms of MS and uh, both uh, entities decided that uh, the evidence is low quality and it's not very clear what the clinical effectiveness is of ozonamide compared to other disease modifying drugs for MS. So neither uh, one of those uh, groups recommend using ozonamide. Next slide, please. There is a new formulation of fingolimod. Uh, it's a orally disintegrating tablet, which re received FDA approval in December of 2021. This uh, orally disintegrating tablet is indicated to treat relapsing forms of MS in pediatric patients who are 10 years of age and older, and they must weigh less than or equal to 40 kilos. Uh, once the child uh, grows and weighs more than 40 kilos, they need to start on another product that's approved for use in that population. Uh, in comparison, the capsule formulation of fingolimod or gelania received FDA approval for use in pediatric patients that were 10 years, of old, 10 years or older with relapsing forms of MS in December 2019. Jelenia comes uh, in two different uh, dosage forms, the 0.25 and the 0.5 milligram forms, where the oral disintegrating tablet only comes as, as one dosage form. So um, it's a little bit easier, I think, if somebody starts on Jelenia to um, keep that on that as they begin to um, gain weight and age out of the parameters for the new formulation. Next slide, please. So in summary, based on the clinical evidence from the systematic reviews and the uh, clinical guidelines, we have no changes to the preferred uh, drug list based on the cl clinical evidence that was reviewed. We did want to consolidate uh, the PAs for the injectable drugs, um, and I'll go over those in just a minute. And then we also wanted to compare medication costs in exec session. So um, on the next slide, the PA consolidation that we decided to do was after we had already posted our documents uh, 30 days prior to the meeting. And we decided that if we modeled uh, the injectable MS drug PA criteria similar to what we already have in place for the oral MS drugs, that we would be able to retire the PA criteria for PEG interferon, ocrelizumab, and ofatuumab. So um, I'll go through the um, I don't believe, I'm not sure if this is in your packet or not, but this is what we decided to do. And basically we just combined the PA criteria that had already been in the packet for those three drugs. So we're recommending that any of the non-preferred injectable or infused MS uh, drugs that are administered either through pharmacy or physician administered claims be covered under this PA criteria. 
We're still going to keep separate criteria for Tisabri um, because it has a couple more safety issues than the other drugs and also um, it has approval for Crohn's disease. And we were trying to keep the uh, PA criteria as simple as possible. And then ofatuumab has been on the market uh, for quite a while as an oncology agent. So if there are requests for Arzera, which is the brand name for the oncology product, that would be reviewed under the oncology PA. So the first two steps are, are very typical. What's the diagnosis? And is it for an FDA um, approved form of MS? Table one is at the bottom. I'll go through that in just a minute. These um, other criteria, there's no change here. We, we've always requested that um, they assess if it's for continuation of therapy and if the drug has been, we wanna make sure it's prescribed by a neurologist. If they're getting a concurrent disease modifying drug, um, that's a reason to deny the claim. And then we put another table in there similar to our oral drugs uh, with the baseline uh, testing that's required to mitigate safety concerns. Next slide, please. So uh, we're also asking that the patient try um, at least uh, two first-line agents uh, indicated for the treatment of S MS before advancing to some of these other um, drugs. And then some of the drugs uh, do have risks in pregnancy, specifically ofatuumab and mitoxantrone. So this is our standard uh, pregnancy language that we've developed. Uh, we try to keep this consistent in all of our other criteria uh, to assess if there's any uh, teratogenic risks. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and then here's the renewal criteria. So this is the table I was alluding to. Instead of asking specific questions about the different indications, uh, we thought it would be easier to put a table together. And you'll see that ocrelizumab is the only one that's used for primary progressive MS. Uh, Alemtuzumab and mitoxantrone are not approved to use uh, for um, the isolated syndrome, this, which is usually the first symptom that's seen with uh, MS primarily because they have uh, more safety issues than the other injectables, but you'll see that pretty much all the drugs uh, in this table are approved for all relapsing forms of MS and the secondary progressive forms. Next slide, please. This is the new table I alluded to with this, the baseline safety adjustments. These come from the prescribing information um, in terms of what's recommended before people start treatment. Again, we just thought it would be easier to have a table instead of um, having specific questions about all the different uh, safety assessments, except for pregnancy. We did have a separate criteria for that that's embedded um, in the uh, steps. And the only other changes we had with the PA criteria were clinical edicts for uh, Delphin Pyramid uh, or Empyra. Uh, we just clarified the uh, renal assessment. So with that, um, are there any questions for me? I know I went through that rather quickly. Um, just to summarize, there's no changes to the PDL based on the clinical evidence. Uh, we'll consolidate the PAs for the injectable MS drugs with the exception of Tisabri, and then we'll look at medication costs in exec session. I Thank think, you, Deanna. Good job. Sorry, question? Deanna, could I, ask, I think I saw one line where it was like you had to have two prior therapies tried. Yes. Um, and I think that was maybe new or maybe it was old. Um, is that, so that like makes sense for all the drugs that are non-preferred? to have yes. sort of failed two prior lines with interferon okay. plus something else? Fantastic question. Yes, that's just carried over from all of our other PA criteria. If you look at the oral MS drugs, which are in the packet, um, that's our usual request is had they tried and failed two drugs. Uh, right now, our preferred uh, agents are the interferons and uh, glutiramir. Um, after exec session, that may change. Uh, when we take a look at the different costs for the agents. So um, this PA criteria may change as well after exec session um, if we decide that uh, maybe trying and failing two drugs isn't warranted for all of the agents, but that's a great question. That's, that's our standard is to have them try and fail at least two drugs. Um, I didn't go into a lot of detail about MS. A lot of it's in the packet, but um, there are two different schools of thoughts about how to initiate uh, MS therapy. Some um, providers like to go with the more aggressive medications um, to, uh, 
immediately have an impact on relapses. The, the problem is the um, more aggressive medications also have more side effects. And then there's the other school of thought to um, start with the interferons, which are the most tried and true agents for MS um, and see how patients respond. Um, so I think it depends on which neurologist you talk to. And I think a lot of it also depends on um, what, what the patient's comfortable with. Do they wanna go with oral or do they wanna go with injectables? And the other thing is I think we're just seeing a lot of new drugs um, get ex uh, approved for MS and there are quite a few new drugs in the pipeline as well. So that's a great question. Yeah, this class review is super impressive. So kudos. Um, but yeah, I guess like just the concern, as you said, it's a dynamic therapeutic landscape as the two drug requirement becomes sort of tenuous, but I don't feel strongly. But. Other questions for Deanna? We do have two uh, industry representatives that have signed up for public comment. Uh, we'll start with uh, Shirley Quash from Novartis. Shirley, are you able to unmute your line? Yes, can you hear me? Hear you loud and clear. Great. The floor is yours. Great. Well, thank you. Um, good afternoon, Oregon PNT committee members. My name is Shirley Quatch, and I am a population health MSL at Novartis Pharma. I just want to first thank you for your thorough and thoughtful review of the MS class and this opportunity to provide updated information on key symptom and respectfully request that key symptom be added as preferred to the Oregon PDL. Key symptom is the first fully human anti CD20 monoclonal antibody for targeted B cell therapy in RMS and offers the advantage of being self administered monthly and no requirement of pre medication. Despite multiple DMTs or disease modifying therapies being available for the treatment of MS, there remains no standard treatment guideline. And as Deanna mentioned, providers tend to make trade offs between efficacy and safety when choosing which agents to use. Studies have shown that um, DMTs have been most effective when aggressive treatments or high efficacy therapies have been applied very early in the clinical course of MS, therefore delaying disease progression, progression and reducing societal economic burden of MS. B cell therapies slow disease progression and are the newest, most effective type of agents used in the MS space. And there is currently no B cell therapy option available on your PDL in a preferred position. Kesenta offers providers a highly efficacious MS agent with a favorable safety profile via monthly self-administered injection with long-term data out to four years. The four-year long-term uh, efficacy and safety data for Kesenta treatment in patients with RMS in the ongoing Alithios extension study was presented and shared at AAN in April of 2022. Treating patients early and continuously with Kesenta was associated with fewer relapses, a reduced risk of three-month and six-month confirmed disability worsening, and a lower MRI lesion load compared to those who switched um, from another product. But for those participants who did switch from teraflunamide to Kesimpta in the extension phase, they did demonstrate pronounced reductions in relapses and MRI lesions. And Kesimpta maintained a similar safety profile as seen in the pivotal phase three trials up to four years of treatment with no new safety risk identified over the treatment period. In summary, Kesimpta has the power, precision, and flexibility to help MS patients control their disease and offers a highly efficacious self-administered B-cell therapy with a good safety profile. And currently there are no B-cell therapy that is preferred on the PDL and Novartis respectfully requests that key symptom be added as a preferred agent. Thank you for your time and consideration and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have for me. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley. Any questions from the committee for Shirley? All right. Uh, we also have from Biogen, uh, Linda Finch. Linda, are you able to unmute your line? I am. Can you hear me? Hear you loud and clear. Great. And Thank the you floor is yours. Here. Great. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Linda Finch. I'm a medical account director with Biogen, and today I'm going to be speaking about Bumerity or Deruximal Fumarate. Bumerity was approved in October 2019 for the treatment of relapsing forms of MS, and that includes clinically isolated syndrome, relapsing remitting MS, and active secondary progressive MS in adults. 
Fumarity has a distinct chemical structure from tecfidera or dimethyl fumarate, but it's converted to the same active metabolite, monomethyl fumarate. And because of this bioequivalence, we expect to see the same efficacy and safety as tecfidera, which has now been prescribed in over 425,000 patients, representing over 810,000 patient years. The 10-year data from the long-term endorsed trial of tecfidera reported 73% of patients having zero or one relapse and over 50% having no relapses in 10 years. Also, 64% of those patients, importantly, had no progression in disability over 10 years. Fumarity has been studied as an alternative to tecfidera for improved patient-reported GI tolerability. Um, the study um, for this was Evolve MS2. It was a phase three randomized active controlled five-week head-to-head study that evaluated patient-reported GI tolerability versus tecfidera in relapse-remitting MS patients. Patients treated with fumarity experienced a statistically significant improvement in a patient-reported outcome um, measuring GI adverse event symptom intensity. Uh, what we saw was that uh, study discontinuations were only 1.6% in fumarity patients versus 6% in tecfidera patients. The GI discontinuation rate specifically were 0.8% for fumarity and 4.8% for tecfidera. Um, recently published real-world data has reinforced that patients are highly adherent to fumarity with proportion of days covered over 90%, consistent with um, what we saw in clinical trial data. And as mentioned in Deanna's report, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence published guidance in June 2022, recommending duroxyl fumarate or fumarity as a first-line DMD option for treatment of active relapsing remitting MS. So, um, as you know, this is a progressive illness and it's important to have access to the appropriate medication as early in the disease as possible to prevent relapse and disability progression. Uh, and these oral disease modifying therapies are very different medications, different mechanisms of action, different tolerability profiles, monitoring requirements, uh, drug interactions and contraindications, and all these factor into appropriate drug selection. So in conclusion, I respectfully ask that you consider adding Vimerity to your PDL as a first line option for patients with relapsing forms of MS. Thank you very much for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much, Linda. Any questions for Linda? I'll just comment that um, as a group, we did evaluate the NICE guidance regarding um, having uh, duroxamil as a first line agent. And if you look at our oral PA uh, criteria that starts on page 105, <clears throat> currently all of the oral drugs are non-preferred and it's mostly because of the safety edits that are required, the safety assessments. And um, if you scroll down to um, <clears throat> page 109, right there, uh, next page, there, all the safety uh, edits are right there that are required um, before uh, people start on treatment. And we thought it would be uh, wiser to just keep all those safety edits in place um, just to make sure that um, the appropriate screening is being done prior to these, the initiation of these medications. Thanks, Sarah, for bringing that up. Deanna, this is Eddie, I have a question. Am sure. I reading this, uh, this correctly, the oral PA criteria correctly? Um, it does not require uh, injectable? No. A it trial of an injectable requires, first, right? Okay. It just requires a trial and failure of two products. Um, except if it's being used for ulcerative colitis. <laughs> I think you might see that criteria up there. So yeah, if you, if you scroll up a little bit, Sarah. Um, and we did pull out the, uh, I thought we had trial and failure of two drugs. Let me see. That's why I was confused. I don't see that in there. Yeah, yeah I, I think you're right. We don't have it in there. Um, So right now, um, we just want to make sure they've done all the safety so they don't have to step through any of the injectables prior to trying these. We just wanted to make sure that, um, that they did uh, do the screening before the drug was initiated. And I think that speaks to the fact that some people don't want to use injections. They would prefer to go with oral therapy. Um, we just want to make sure that they've done all the screening and if there's pregnancy risks that that's been addressed with the patient as well. Great point, Eddie. 
And uh, we did have uh, one of uh, the representatives from Janssen Scientific that signed up to provide public comment, had given their time back, but in light of some of the conversation that's going on, would like to uh, provide some public comment. So uh, Sophia Yun with Janssen Scientific Affairs, are you able to unmute your line? Thanks so much for your flexibility, Roger and the committee members. Hello. Hello, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a uh, I'm a pharmacist with Janssen Scientific Affairs. Thanks so much for this opportunity to provide testimony on Pomvori or Panesimod, which was approved in March of 21 for the treatment of adults with relapsing forms of MS, clinically isolated syndrome, and active secondary progressive disease. Pomvori received its approval by the FDA based on results from the Optimum study, which was the first head-to-head -head study comparing two oral DMTs. Optimum was a phase three randomized control trial comparing terafutamide with Pomvori, and Pomvori showed an annualized relapse rate reduction of 30.5%, which translates to approximately one relapse every five years for patients receiving Pomvori versus one relapse every 3.5 years for those taking Abagio. Pomvori also demonstrated fewer brain lesions and a lower degree of brain volume loss than Abagio. Brain volume loss has been shown to be greater in patients who suffer from MS than those who do not have the disease. And the safety profile of Pomvori was similar to Abagio and consistent with other medication in its class. In a long-term follow-up analysis, approximately 60% of patients were still taking Pomvori after eight years. The PK data that's available for Pomvori demonstrates a 33-hour half-life with lymphocyte counts uh, to shown to return to baseline in 90% of patients after seven days after the last dose. And patients may also attempt pregnancy seven days after the last dose of Pomvori, which is the shortest interval in its class. Pomvori has fewest barriers to initiation among the S1P class. It requires no genetic testing, has a low potential for DDIs, and no 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 known drug food interactions and a fewer than 10% should require the first dose cardiac monitoring. I really appreciate Deanna's comment earlier related to the potential for the review of the step criteria of the oral uh, DMTs during the executive session. And we respectfully request that Oregon patients step through only one agent before starting, starting Pomvori due to the superiority of Pomvori over Abagio per the optimum trial which was also called out by the DERM's NICE guideline updates. So really appreciate you adding that in there. Least amount of restrictions to start up um, as compared to some of the other S1Ps in the class, uh, along with the short half-life allowing for a quick recovery of lymphocytes in the event of an infection and for the pregnancy in a population that's largely composed of women of childbearing age. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Sophia. Any questions for Sophia? All right. So again, we'll put the recommendations back on the screen. No changes based on the clinical evidence. We're going to consolidate the PAs for the injectable MS drugs and look at costs in executive session. Questions, comments? Sorry, this is Eddie again. I, yes. I, I'm, I'm still a little bit confused. Can you um, help clarify, Deanna, what the last part is of that, uh, the oral PA criteria where it says, uh, it says has the, I, I lost it on my screen, but it says something about have they tried alternative agents? I'm just curious what that is referring to. Um, it's number yeah. 24. I, I think that was the, um, a way to say, have they tried other treatments before going to, uh, the oral therapy? Um, because usually we do that further above. So, um, that is saying that they need to try it doesn't say they need to try two. It just says if they tried other therapy before starting these oral agents. Um, if you feel like uh, maybe we should eliminate that request, we, we could certainly entertain that. 
I think for the UC treatment, it still is, is probably a good option um, for the ulcerative colitis uh, assessment. Well, as I follow through the table, it seems that criteria number 24 is only applicable if the request is for a fumarate product. So I just wanted to clarify if that was intentional. No, that Whereas, was not, that was not intentional. I think it was. I think that might have happened when we were adding the pregnancy assessment the last time we looked at this, and then when we added the UC because we did review Ponbori last year, um, when we reviewed Casempta uh, as well. So good eye. It's always good to have good attention to detail. <laughs> Um, Actually, it's not only for that one. It does look like it also applies to the the swing the S one P. It does it, apply to that one too. Yeah, I, I think that the idea was that they would work through everything in here, um, and then that would be the last thing: is have they tried other agents? Um, like I said, I think it just got moved to the bottom when we were adding all the other criteria instead of being up at the top, which it might make more sense to do that assessment at the beginning. I guess the question is, um, does the committee think that a trial and failure failure of interferon or glutiramir, or glutiramir those are the two uh, um, preferred agents that don't require PA, do you think that's warranted before they start on an oral agent? Is that in alignment with the guideline recommendations that you presented? Um, the guidelines are changing, uh, quite quite frankly, and um, it, it's really I think the idea is to engage the patient and see what their preference is, and then the other the other concern is how aggressive does the provider want to be with initiating therapy? Some people will go right to ocrelizumab, which is an infused drug when someone's diagnosed with MS, um, as opposed to maybe stepping through interferon or um, uh, glutiramir. So that's a great question. So I, I think, I mean, hearing that, I think it's appropriate to have a pathway to orals without having to go through the injectables. Um, I'm, I'm so still I, not. I think it might be reasonable to revise question 24 um, just for ulcerative colitis for ozonamod to make sure that they've tried other um, treatments before they go to uh, ozonamod for UC. I, I think you're right. I, I think um, the modifying question 24 just for the UC assessment instead of MS would make sense. And then also looking at criteria number five, so earlier in, in the table, it refers to uh, changing to a preferred product, but it seems like there, there are no preferred products when it comes to the oral there are, agents. Is no. that right? No, it's just interferon or glutiramir. And that's standard for to us to ask if they want to switch okay. to preferred when we have non-preferred. Um, and, and basically they don't have to step through it. All we're asking there is, will they try a preferred? And yes, they, they might try a preferred, then we let them know. If not, then they just go through the next steps. I see, so that's not just specifically referring to the oral. No, that, that's it's a referring question. to the whole class. Okay. That's just standard, uh, that, that's standard when we have um, preferred agents in the class that we ask, do they, will they switch to a preferred? And that's part of our assessment when we're looking at preferred and non-preferred. Is there a pathway to treat? Any other comments or um, observations about the oral MS criteria? So did we land on a place where we're gonna edit the proposed PA criteria to move the question? Or you want to make that motion, Eddie? Sorry, I'm I, I think so, but I still I don't know exactly where that's supposed to go. 
Um, I think your motion would be modify question number 24 to eliminate uh, trial and failure of uh, any other agents before um, moving to an oral MS drug, but just keep question 24 for the ulcerative colitis assessment for ozonamide. Okay, that, that, yes, that's, that, that, yes, I think so. Yep, that's, that would be my motion. <laughs> Second. Thanks, Pat. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstain? Great conversation. Motion passes, so thank you. Continuing on, we'll turn your direction to or attention to page 119 in the packet of materials. Uh, we'll turn it over to Sarah Fletcher for the lit scan. Thanks, Roger. Um, this will be a quick presentation as well. If you can go to the next slide, we were just doing a literature evaluation or a lit scan to look at new information that's come around since 2021 when we last reviewed this class, as well as doing some um, internal assessment of class usage. So the next slide, background, I know um, everyone's familiar with this from last year, but most treatment drug therapy for HIV involves a three drug regimen with a two drug NRTI backbone with an add on therapy that's most commonly an integrase inhibitor or a protease inhibitor. We looked at our internal usage from the first quarter of 2022, and there are about 150 patients taking um, medications for HIV or HIV prevention. The single tablet regimens were for three drug therapy were the most commonly used and then combination two drug NRTI regimens were um, also quite frequent and some of those were being used for prep and some of those were being um, combined with an additional tablet for an add on therapy. This has been a consistent trend for the last several years. We looked about three years back and um, only a small proportion of patients had claims for the first line two drug single tablet regimens that have an NRTI and an integrase inhibitor. Um, and then roughly about a third of the claims um, involved drugs for multi-tablet regimens. And the most common add-on therapies were dolutegravir, darunavir, and rilpivirine for um, the different add-on types. And then we wanted to note that there was no recent usage within the last several years for some of the drugs that um, in previous guidelines that we reviewed, they're actually no longer recommended. And that's for efficacy reasons because of the um, new agents that have come about that are much more efficacious as well as some side effects that limit their um, applicability to patients. So we can go to the next page. Uh, all of the systematic reviews that I found, most of them included retrospective data or other reasons um, for quality that they were excluded. And so for the next page, um, you can actually see that I only included six randomized controlled trials in this literature scan. Those can be seen on Appendix 2 and page 127 in more detail, and most of them support some of the information on the next page for new indications. Um, two of these trials were cabotegravir use in PrEP. Actually, Sarah, yeah, stay there. Um, cabotegravir use in PrEP. There were two studies. One was a superiority study used in women um, at risk of HIV, and the other one was in uh, cisgender men who have sex with men and transgender women, and that was a non-inferiority study. There was also a dolutegravir study versus a fabrin-based PrEP therapy for efficacy and pregnancy safety. And this one was important because of some safety signals that had been identified in the past with risk of congenital malformations with dolutegravir, but that was not seen in this, um, in this study. And it was a, uh, it was not retrospective. It was a prospective study. There was also a Descovy versus Truvada, which are two different PrEP formulations with different tenofovir formulations. Um, and that was a non-inferiority study that also looked at some of the safety data between the two different products. And then the last two were Doravirine versus Efavirenz for um, efficacy and also looking at neuropsychiatric outcomes. This was also a non-inferiority study and Efavirenz is well known to have um, a number of neuropsychiatric adverse events that limit its use for some patients. And that was seen here as well. And then finally, dolutegravir versus non-dolutegravir based therapy in pediatric patients. This was first or second line and it helped to support um, the new indication. So if you could go to the next page, or next slide, Sarah. There were a number of new indications. Um, you can see several of the triple drug regimens, uh, Triumec and Victarvi, which contain um, three regimens as well. They're all indicated now for pediatrics down to different weight categories and then Dorvirian based regimens as well. And then next slide, 
Cabo Tigre which we reviewed in NDE on in the last, um, the last time this was presented, it has a number of new indications. As monotherapy, it now is indicated for PrEP, and that's for adults and for adolescents, down to 35 kilograms. Um, it also, in the dual therapy with vilpivirine, it has an expanded indication to every two-month dosing instead of just monthly. They've also removed the need for the mandatory lead-in therapy and expanded it down to 12 years of age and 35 kilograms. And then you can see the tablet formulations for both of those have expanded indications that align with the new injectable indications. So next slide. So recommendations that we're making, um, we, and based off of just reviewing our internal usage, as well as discussion with some experts in the area, we wanted to change stavudine, didanosine, sequinavir, and nilfinavir to non-preferred because they're not recommended anymore, um, and no one should be using them, and right now no one is, so we don't want that to start before they're removed from the market. So if anyone has any questions before we have, we have a couple of public commenters. Good job, Sarah. All right, first we have uh, Caitlin Wynn with Vive Healthcare. Are you able to unmute yourself? Yes, I think I'm unmuted. Is my audio coming through okay? Yep, we hear you loud and clear. Perfect. Well, hello and good morning, everyone. My name is Caitlin Wynn. I'm a medical science liaison with Vive Healthcare, and I'm here to speak on the importance of open access for guideline preferred antiretrovirals. 40 years ago, HIV was considered fatal. Today, a person with HIV can take effective ART to live a long, healthy life and if taken consistently, prevents further transmission. The advancement of pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP empowers people who could benefit to protect themselves and their partners. These medical developments provided a light at the end of the tunnel and gave us hope something unimaginable in the early days of the epidemic. As we reflect on our past, we must also look towards the future where HIV is no longer a public health challenge, a future where we have achieved our national goal of ending the HIV epidemic. Through significant advances, people with HIV are able to more easily achieve and sustain suppression Yet virus suppression along with adherence remain lowest in the Medicaid population. It's estimated that by 2020 in the US, more than 70% of people living with HIV will be aged 50 and older. This aging population facing polypharmacy and comorbidities reinforces the need for individualized treatment options to minimize HIV burden. And when it comes to HIV, there is no one size fits all. Patient-centric treatments provide the best opportunity for retention in care and long-term adherence. Providers should be entrusted to construct a viable regimen to achieve optimal outcomes for your members. Innovative guidelines supported 2DR such as Tavato and Cabanuba may mitigate the cumulative toxicity of long-term ART and preserve future treatment options. Cabanuva and Apertude are the first long-acting options that assure adherence in treatment and PrEP, alleviating HIV stigma, the fear of disclosure associated with daily oral pills. According to the ACE Institute, step therapy and prior authorization should never be used in the treatment of HIV and run counter to the US government sponsored guidelines. As we collectively work towards the CDC's vision of a future free of HIV, I ask for your consideration in keeping open access for HIV medications, especially those strongly recommended by guidelines to ensure equity and ultimately end the HIV epidemic by 2030. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Caitlin. Any questions for Caitlin? Okay, we also have Stuart Obrachta from Gilead. Stuart, are you able to unmute your line? I am, and I have a Jerry Garcia tie-in for you, Roger. As you I request. forgot mine today, but I was hoping you were wearing one. It, day. It's all right. I, I have a nice one on, so it's for both of us. Thank, uh, thank you. you for your time today. And um, as Caitlin just uh, mentioned, I want to thank you for having open access to the DHHS first line HIV reg, re, uh, recommended regimens. And I like to highlight a. Uh, by the way, I'm from Gilead Sciences, and I'm a medical scientist. Um, I'd like to highlight a few things, a couple 
uh, label updates for Victarvi and some of the highlights of why I would um, ask that you would continue to keep open access to Victarvi and the other first line agents. Um, and three label updates in the last year and a half are renal impairment. We now have in hemodialysis patients the ability to use this down to an EGFR of 15 um, with chronic hemodialysis. And currently, it, it is approved down to an EGFR of 30, which is, a, um, which is lower than many approved agents. Geriatric use, which is a very important um, aspect of the aging population, down to now 60, um, up to 65, <laughs> um, we have a, um, information that shows that it's safe and effective in that population, which is a critical um, as that patients grow and now, now represent more than 50% of the population. Also a pediatric indication for patients weighing between 14 and 25 kilograms. There have been three recent key publications, one I'd like to highlight that was pub, uh, this summer at the International AIDS Conference, and that's the Alliance trial, which um, showed TAF-based regimens, Bictarvi, being superior in HBV co-infection control to um, TDFR, tenofovir-based therapies. So highlighting the importance of HBV in the uh, treatment of HIV with, with the co-infection there. So in summary, a few uh, additional characteristics of Bictarvi is it is the only triple drug TAF integrase-based therapy with long-term safety data in a, a broad range of people living with HIV with now clinical trial data out to five years, the only agent for that. Um, and as already pointed out by the last speaker, ending the epidemic is very important and it's also approved for rapid start, which is also critical. And in the Medicaid population specifically where loss to follow up is, is um, an issue with HIV care and being able to start on the first day without um, additional screening is critical. In the five-year data that has been studied, we only have six discontinuations related to adverse drug um, effects, which is um, has never been seen in HIV trials. So adding to the safety and effectiveness of um, Bictarvi in, in the population. There are multiple real-world trials that are highlighting the fact that what we're seeing in the clinical trials. And I would respectfully request that based on this data, that you would maintain open access to Bictarvi and the other first-line DHS recommended regimens. Thank you for your time, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Stuart. Any questions for Stuart? There, I can see the tie now. All right. <laughs> no questions for Stuart? Great. We'll put the recommendations back up. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Again, we're simply recommending that these four agents be switched to non-preferred since there is no utilization. They're not recommended to be used. And in fact, uh, some or all of them might be pulled from the market, so won't be lending itself towards new starts. Questions or a motion to approve? Move to approve. Thank you, Bill. Second. Thank you, Eddie. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anybody abstain? Great, thank you. Thanks, Sarah. All right, we'll continue on. Uh, direct your attention to page 135 if you're following along in the packet and we'll turn it over to Kathy Centena for an update. Great, thanks, Roger. So yeah, the purpose of this update is to identify and evaluate new evidence for the glucagon-like peptide one receptor agonist class or the GLP-1 RAs as well as a sodium glucose co-transporter 2 or SGLT2 inhibitor class um, and look at that new evidence since the last reviews. Uh, additionally, we wanna look at a new drug. Uh, we wanna determine the place in therapy for terzepatide or Munjaro. It's a GLP-1 RA and a glucose dependent insulinotropic polypeptide or GIP uh, receptor agonist that was approved in May of 2022 for adult patients with type two diabetes. Uh, both these classes were last reviewed in 2020 and 2021. Um, and the focus of this review will be on these two classes for people with type two diabetes. There is evidence that the use of GLP-1 RAs um, when, when used in people with and without diabetes results in weight, weight reduction. 
Uh, but the use of these drugs that are indicated for weight loss alone are not going to be covered in this review, and evidence for this purpose will be addressed in future reviews. So going to the next slide, just give a little bit of background since a lot of these drugs have received additional indications. So just go over them briefly for the SGLT2 class. Um, of course, they're all indicated for glucose lowering. But in addition to that, uh, canagliflozin as well as empagliflozin are indicated for reduction in cardiovascular events in adults that have type 2 diabetes and either established cardiovascular disease or at high risk for them. Canagliflozin also has an additional indication in patients with type 2 diabetes to reduce the risk of end-stage kidney disease, doubling of serum creatinine, cardiovascular death, and hospitalization for heart failure. Uh, Dipagliflozin also has the additional indication of um, actually dipagliflozin as well as an empagliflozin have the heart failure indication. So the reduction in the risk of cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure in adults with heart failure. And dipagliflozin has this indication for reduced ejection fraction um, in patients with or without diabetes. And empagliflozin has this indication for those with reduced or preserved ejection fraction in patients with or without diabetes. And then lastly, dipagliflozin also has an additional indication for those um, individuals with or without diabetes for reduction in the risk of sustained EGFR decline and stage kidney disease cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure in adults with chronic kidney disease at risk of progression. So um, the preferred agents that we have for the SGLT2 class are canagliflozin, dipagliflozin, and empagliflozin. Uh, the current PA criteria does require a step therapy with metformin. If we go on to look at the GLP-1 um, RAs, they're a little bit simpler. They, um, in addition to the glucose lowering indication, doliglutide, liraglutide, and semaglutide do have that additional indication for reduction in the risk of major cardiovascular events, um, all in patients with type 2 diabetes. The preferred agents in this class are doliglutide, exenatide, and liraglutide, and they um, do not require PA if there's a history or current use of metformin, if they're preferred therapy. So moving on to the new literature, there were two systematic reviews and meta-analyses identified for this review. Um, the first one was a cardiovascular outcome study uh, with SGLT2 inhibitors, and it found that um, this class was more effective than placebo in people with type 2 diabetes and either risk factors or actually having presence of cardiovascular disease um, for the following outcomes. And this, these outcomes were all based on moderate quality evidence, so it's found to reduce uh, cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure, all-cause mortality, major adverse ca cardiovascular events, hospitalization for heart failure, and emergency department visits for heart failure. Additionally, subgroup analysis found that these findings were consistent across um, different, different groups, so across sex, ethnicities, and age. Uh, the se second systematic review was a review of the GLP-1 RAs and the risk of gallbladder and biliary disease. Um, when these agents were confused, compared to other uh, placebo or active treatments, such as glomeparide, citagliptin, glargine, and others, they were found to have an increased risk of uh, gallbladder or biliary disease with a relative risk of 1.37. Uh, this is an additional 27 events per 10,000 patients treated. And this was based on high quality evidence. Moving on, there were a couple new guidelines identified. They are both from NICE, and NICE did a update, um, a focus update rather, just looking at the SGLT2 class to update their type 2 diabetes management in adults document. And what they found um, is when looking at uh, SGLT2 inhibitor use in people with cardiovascular disease or at high risk of developing cardiovascular disease is that, um, that patients without cormitive comorbidity should still be receiving metformin first line. However, those that do have chronic heart failure or kind of some kind of established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease should be offered an SGLT2 inhibitor that has demonstrated proven benefit in addition to metformin. And that would include those um, empagliflozin, canagliflozin, and dipagliflozin all having those uh, indications and demonstrated benefit. And then the second review looked at dipagliflozin use for chronic kidney disease in patients with and without diabetes. And they, NICE does recommend this as an option for adults with chronic kidney disease who meet additional criteria, such as having diabetes or receiving standard of care for chronic kidney disease or um, having reduced renal function. 
Moving on to formulations and indications, there's um, a new formulation, it's semi-glutide, uh, brand name Rebelsis, and it's an oral formulation of the injectable semi-glutide um, semi formulation Ozempic. This oral tablet's given once daily for um, as an adjunct to diet and exercise to improve glycemic control in adult patients with type 2 diabetes. As with other GLPs, there's a box warning for a risk of thyroid C-cell tumors. Um, and so this um, applies to this product as well. Uh, then looking at the five new indication or labeling changes for dipagliflozin, we do see that expanded indication for risk reduction um, in patients uh, with sustained EGFR decline and stage kidney disease, uh, cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure in adults with uh, CKD or at risk of progression. Exenatide, the once weekly bidurian formulation received an expanded indication for use in pediatric patients 10 years of age and older um, with type 2 diabetes. For empagliflozin, we do see the expanded indication for the reduction of the risk of cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure, um, again, in those with re reduced and preserved ejection fraction. Uh, the combination product of paglifosin and metformin received the expanded indication for the reduction of cardiovascular death and hospitalization of heart failure in adults with heart failure um, with reduced ejection fraction, as well as an additional indication for the reduction of risk of sustained EGFR decline and stage kidney disease, cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure in adults with CKD at risk of progression. And again, this is in patients with or without diabetes. And then uh, lixicenatide had the FDA remove the statement that lixicenatide has not been studied in combination with short acting insulin um, from their labeling. And then lastly, I just want to verbally mention that semi-glutide injection of um, Zempic has also a new strength available as of March of 2022, which is a higher two milligram um, once weekly dose. Uh, so adding that to the 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and one milligram dose already available. Moving on to safety alerts, again, for that GLP RA class, as we already discussed, there's that warning that there might be an increased risk of acute gallbladder disease, and that should be monitored. Uh, for exenatide in February of 2020, there's uh, increased risk of drug-induced thrombocytopenia has been reported, uh, including serious bleeding and fatalities. And so discontinuing exenatide promptly if this occurs, so that was added to the warning, warning labeling. And then lastly, the combination of dipagliflozin and saxagliptin um, they had the warning added that it might cause dipagliflozin component might cause intravascular volume depletion and hypotension, which is consistent with other SGLT2s, um, but that was updated recently. Moving on to randomized control trials, we do have four that I'll try to go over briefly because some of these already related to the expanded indications that we've already referenced a couple of times. So uh, we'll go over it briefly, like I said, but feel free to ask questions. Um, the first one is the Emperor Preserve trial. This was a study with a paglifosin compared to a placebo in adults um, with preserved ejection fraction and heart failure with a, um, the primary endpoint being a composite of cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure in which empagliflozin was found to be superior with a number needed to treat of 30. Uh, the next trial was a non-inferiority trial, the Virtus CV trial, looking at ertugliflozin versus placebo um, in patients with diabetes and um, type 2 diabetes and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And it did find that for the incidence of major adverse cardiovascular events, that ertugliflozin was non-inferior to placebo. Looking at the next trial, it's the DAPA-CKD trial. This was looked at dipagliflozin uh, versus placebo in adults with or without diabetes with reduced renal function. And they found for the composite outcome of sustained decline in EGFR of at least 50% in stage kidney disease or death from renal or cardiovascular causes that dipagliflozin was superior to placebo with a number needed to treat of 19. And then the last study was the Emperor Reduce study. This looked at empagliflozin versus placebo in adult patients with or without diabetes with heart failure. And for the composite endpoint of cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure, empagliflozin was superior to placebo with a number needed to treat of 19. And are there any questions before we go on to the new drug? Okay, perfect. I, wait, so, wait, wait. I, oh. I, I have some comments if you would let me? Sure, yeah. 
Um, I'm very skeptical of the data of the SGLT2 drugs and cardiovascular outcomes. Most of these studies are multinational studies with a composite endpoint. And if you read all these studies, the ma vast majority of the results are driven by decrease in hospitalizations for congestive failure. Mm -hmm. That is a very fuzzy endpoint. Um, and I was looking, I thought, well, what is the rate of hospitalizations in all these countries? So I was able to find some information, European Heart Network, about hospital admissions per thousand for congestive heart failure in a bunch of European countries. And there was a four to 500% range from the highest to the lowest. And some of them were very surprising. The highest admission rates were in Romania, Lithuania, um, and Germany. The lowest rates were in Denmark, Netherlands, Switzerland, and Turkey. Uh, and some very similar countries had quite different. The uh, hospitalization rates in Sweden were twice what they were in Denmark. The hospitalization rates in Belgium was much lower than either France or Germany, which are both contiguous. The, the text said, this is due to two factors. First factor is different, different, uh, different burdens of diseases in different countries, and mostly it has to do with second is the cultural and economic things around hospital admissions. One of my other jobs is doing hospital UR. Over the last decade, I have done written reviews on 15,000 hospital admissions. And I can tell you, that the biggest variability in um, heart failure patients is not the severity of the disease, but two things. R biggest variability is the ability of the patient or their family to cope with the disease. And there are a lot of people who are admitted with mild disease because the family can't take care of it. And the other thing is comorbid conditions. Someone who has both chronic lung disease and chronic congestive heart failure who presents with dyspnea, it's very difficult to tell which illness causes it, and usually it's both. So things like mortality, if you're dead in Delhi, you're dead in Denver. But if you need to be hospitalized in Belgrade versus Geneva versus Salt Lake City, there's a huge variation. And so there's a 300% variation in the baseline rate, but the benefit is on the order of three to 5%. So you got a noise level that is about 100 times bigger than the actual progress. So if these drugs truly worked, all of these endpoints would be positive. They would decrease admission rates, decrease MI rates, decrease cardiovascular deaths, and decrease all-cause deaths because there wouldn't be any other uh, compensating factor. Many of the ones who show decreased cardiovascular deaths show no change in all-cause mortality, which means if cardiovascular deaths go down, something else goes up. Or these people are gonna die anyway, it's just a question of which disease. So I'm, I'm skeptical. I'm not sure we need to change anything, but I, I it, it just, um, I think the, the main endpoint of hospitalization across a wide geography is, is not a very useful endpoint. Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate your comments and your, um, you know, your, I guess your review of all the evidence related to hospitalizations. That's really helpful. And I agree that endpoint's not always um, ideal. It is interesting how many of the guidelines have adopted this, even NICE, you know, as indicating this for uh, patients with and without diabetes for heart failure. But I think that's an excellent point. And um, as we look, really dive into the evidence that I really appreciate those comments. You know, if you, you, you did an excellent job, Kathy. And if you look at your summary at the bottom of page 139 and 140 of the SGLT inhibitors, and you look across the different endpoints, there isn't any one endpoint in which all the drugs work. So that tells me that something's wrong here. Because if they truly worked, 
and it worked well, all of those endpoints would be approved. Not just some of them, some of the time. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. And it's, you know, we've got uh, FDA approval and we've got recommendations that we can't ignore, but I'm just, you know, just, just venting my spleen. Thank you. <laughs> Always appreciated for sure. Well, let's look at the new drug and then we can talk more about that um, with the recommendations um, as well. So again, appreciate those comments. Um, so looking at the new drug, terzepatide or uh, Monjaro, it's, as mentioned before, it's a GIP receptor agonist and a GLP-1 receptor agonist indicated for patients with type 2 diabetes. Um, this drug was studied in five different trials um, to obtain approval. All the studies looked at the 5, 10, and 15 milligram sub-Q once weekly dose of terzepatide. Um, the trials lasted 40 to 52 weeks, and the primary outcome was the same in all the trials, which was change in um, in A1C levels from baseline. So looking um, at the trial specific, surpassed three and four were open label non-inferiority trials, but all the others were double blind randomized control trials. In surpass one, there was a benefit um, seen with terzepatide compared to placebo with A1C reductions of um, almost 2% to a little bit over 2% for all the doses. Uh, Suppress 2 was an active treatment comparison trial with semiglutide one milligram weekly, and it did find that it was superior to semiglutide with additional lowering of 0.15 to 0.45% A1C above and beyond semiglutide. Uh, looking at Surpass 3, this was um, uh, terzepatide compared to once daily insulin degladac, and it was a non-inferiority trial, and so it was found to be non-inferior. And then the secondary outcome analysis did show superiority, superiority as well of terzepatide over insulin degladac with uh, additional A1C lowering of 0.59% to about 1%. Uh, looking at the next slide, surpass so four, uh, this was a trial that compared um, terzepatide to insulin guarginine. It also was a non-inferiority open label trial and um, a priority was described as comparing just the 10 and 15 milligram doses, which were shown to be non-inferior as well as superior to insulin, insulin guarginine um, with A1C lowering of about 0.8% to 1.14% um, treatment difference. And this study was interesting too, in that it also enrolled uh, patients who were at high cardiovascular risk and on other um, anti-glycemic agents. And then the last study was another placebo control study, Surpass 5, in which again, it was um, uh, terzepatide was shown to be superior to placebo with A1C lowerings of 1.24 to about 1.47% more than placebo. And across all these trials, the number of patients that obtained an A1C of 7% or more um, was higher with terzepatide with a number needed to, to treat of two to 34 over that 40 to 52 week time frame. Again, worth noting is that this drug um, resulted in substantial weight loss. So about two kilograms to up to 15 kilograms more than placebo active compar uh, comparators across the different trials. Looking at adverse effects, um, most commonly as um, not Unexpected with considering its mechanism of action were nausea, diarrhea, decreased appetite, vomiting, constipation, dyspepsia, and abdominal pain. Um, it also has that black box warning for thyroid C cell tumors, and it's contraindicated in patients with personal family history of medullary thyroid carcinoma like other um, GLPs. And discontinuation rates across the trials was around 9 to 15%, and they were considered to be dose-related. Some limitations to the data that we have on this, of course, um, whether, you know, somewhat short-term tri trials for chronic disease. Uh, some of the trials were open label, which does increase the risk of performance bias. Uh, there was a low rep representation of non-white participants. Um, there was some missing details and outcome assessments. And then lastly, we're still awaiting additional trials um, regarding cardiovascular disease, but there is an ongoing uh, surpassed CVOT trial, which we should get uh, that data. And if, um, are there any questions on terzepatide? Okay, so- um, Is this, this uh, yeah, just a quick question. Yeah. I didn't see any data on differences in side effects compared to just GLB one only. 
agents as our data? Um, well, the this the safety, the clinical safety was just for the terzepatide, the most common side effects. I mean, based on both mechanisms of action. Does that make sense? Was that the question? Uh, I just saw the on head head studies. I didn't see anything stating that there was difference in rates of side effects. So I was wondering if there were versus the GLP one only agonist. Oh yeah, you know, um, that's a great question. I don't know off the top of my head how how they compared, um, but I can definitely look into that. I don't I don't recall that there were substantial differences, but that's a good question. Okay, so moving on then just to some um, recommendations for the PA criteria. So the first one would just be to add this dual mechanism of action um, to the GLP-1 receptor agonist class PA criteria. Um, so you can see that in red there. And then looking at the next slide, um, the only change would be to remove that requirement um, if the, you know, which patients can't, or which patients, which drugs can and cannot be used with prandial insulin. Um, when these drugs first came out, there were some warnings against that, but um, currently there are none um, in the labeling. So it doesn't, these are kind of outdated and don't apply. So just removing question number five and number six. And then moving on to the SGLT2 inhibitor PA criteria, um, there, there is a thought that perhaps we remove this um, requirement that this class goes through, the preferred agents go through the PA criteria. Right now there is that requirement for step therapy with, therapy with metformin. However, considering um, these drugs are indicated in patients without diabetes, um, and most of these agents are preferred, uh, one of my recommendations would be we could remove this PA criteria and then just subject the non-preferred agents to that general non-preferred PA criteria would just ask if the provider would be willing to switch to preferred agent. Um, however, if the committee feels strongly to keep this SGLT specific um, inhibitor PA criteria, I would like to update it with some parameters around the renal testing um, that that had been done in the last 12 months because there's some ambiguity there. Um, we wanna make sure this is, if we're gonna ask for um, that they um, have undergone renal testing, we wanna make sure that it's recent. So the, ne the, the next slide is just the same recommendation for the renewal criteria. So I guess my, um, so well, we can go to the next slide and I'll review my recommendations. And that is to, um, to include the glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide, the GIP therapies to the GLP-PA class, um, requirement class, and then update the criteria to remove the concomitant prandial insulin restriction, as I just discussed, and then consider removing the clinical PA criteria for preferred SGLT2s and just having the non-preferred subject to the general PA criteria and then maintain terzepatide as a non-preferred agent on the PDL, and then no other changes recommended as far as the preferred drug list goes and to evaluate costs in executive session. Comment. Yeah, so I appreciate your comments on the thoughts regarding, especially the criteria, but of course, any comments. You know, we need to have access to these drugs because they are a niche thing and they probably do help. But to say inhibitor is equal in efficacy to metformin is not true by a long shot. And when you say these are indicated for people without diabetes, you know, it's very interesting that they've uh, approved some of these drugs for treatment of congestive failure without comparing them to the 14 standard treatments for congestive failure. If I had congestive failure, I'd much rather take a beta blocker uh, and a diuretic than an SGLT inhibitor. <laughs> you know, I, I think that, that some of the indications for these drugs are, are being widely exaggerated. You know, and I think they do have an itch. I'm not sure what it is, but they're certainly not first-line therapy equal to metformin. 
Yeah, it's, it is interesting that the guidelines and I'm not saying that they're, they're correct, but yeah, they're, you know, they're recommending that even in addition to metformin, they be added for, you know, first line just for those, uh, you know, if somebody's at high risk of cardiovascular disease or has cardiovascular disease and as, um, and the AHA, the American Heart Association also recommends these two in patients without diabetes, but I, I get, you know, I understand the evidence maybe doesn't support all that, but there is this huge uptake. Um, and that doesn't, that doesn't validate, you know, any changes or not, but it's just, it is interesting how they are. Expert opinion is the lowest form of evidence uh, about three notches below controlled double blind studies. <laughs> right. True, true, true. Nice job, Kathy. Other questions for Kathy? We do have uh, one uh, representative to provide public comment. Yeah, this is Tim. Um, on our SGLT2, the only like safety parameter I see there is around the renal function dialysis and going down to the expert opinion thing. So <clears throat> I'm just asking about the other um, more common, potentially challenging side effects like genital urinary, frequent genital urinary infections and electrolyte disturbances. That's the that's what I've seen the most in clinical practice is uh, prescribing despite or continue prescribing despite. And so I wasn't sure if we need to have more safety edits. Just a suggestion and I wasn't sure there's any data to support doing that. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And then they're often seen with these. The reason the renal indications were or um, requirements were in there because they were contraindications. And early on, especially, um, this was even with you know limited short-term data, this is even more of a concern. And that was when it was originally added. Um, we definitely could include additionally safe additional safety edits if if we, you know, I think that's appropriate. Like you said, it is often seen with these drugs um, to have the you know, yeast infections or urinary tract infections. So we could add, we could definitely add that in. I'd want it to be data driven, like Bill was saying that, you know, our studies, um, I mean, they, they're really good at excluding all the people that could have these side effects in the studies that get the drugs approved, but we should hopefully by now have some studies actually saying what real world data is with real patients. And if there is a data-driven reason to add something like that, I would suggest doing that. But if not, I wouldn't clog it up. Okay. Yeah, we don't routinely see that 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 in other states criteria that that is asked for and screened for. Um, so I guess my first inclination would be maybe not add that additional step in there. Um, but I can certainly look into that too. And if there was reason to bring it back, I could, you know, bring that back to the committee if there was findings related to that. I haven't seen anything like that, like I said, but I'll, um, you know, I'll do an extra search just to make sure. Thank you. Yeah, this was one of the classes that had the most post-marketing requirements from the FDA, like forever. So it'd be nice to make sure we're doing good with that. Yeah, sure. I'll definitely double check that. Thank you. So I just wanted to go back to Bill's earlier comments. So Bill, do you have a, a counter proposal to put forward? You know, that's where I don't have the answer because I, um, I think the present policy where it's secondary to metformin still leaves it wide open for a lot of use, but it's, that would be what I would say, because it it is, you know, it's got some role in second or third line treatment, and I don't think that has always been well defined, and I am skeptical of some of the guidelines that they will be sustainable, um, and uh, so I think just not, just keeping what we've got right now is reasonable. I propose. Um, I, I agree with keeping the um, keeping it a second. You know, keeping it as keeping it after metformin. So keeping that in there. But perhaps we could include, you know, a step in there that says if 
if the indication is for CKD, um, that it bypasses that step because we, there wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily be a role for metformin if someone didn't have diabetes, but they were being prescribed dipagliflozin, for example. Um, or, or perhaps if the, if the reason for prescribing is, is heart failure in the absence of diabetes, that that could also be a line that bypasses the metformin. So, so that we preserve the metformin um, criteria for use within diabetes, but not necessarily for those other labeled indications. Yeah, I think that's a great point. We tried to accomplish that in, if you see in number three, it asks if they have, um, if they qualify for treatment based on the table, which has those non-diabetic indications. And then if so, they go to five, which is just asking about the renal requirements. Um, and if not, if it's just for glucose lowering, then they do go through that metformin um, step therapy. So I, th I think that meets uh, the requirements that you're suggesting, but okay. let me yeah. know if you think that wording could be clarified, you know, to make it more, make more sense. But I think what you said is exactly what we intended. So, okay. If that's how it's applied, then I, then I support that. Okay, great. Great discussion. Good job, Kathy. Um, we do have, as I said, uh, one representative to provide public comment, uh, Jessica Chardulia. I don't know how you pronounce your last name. I probably just butchered it. Are you able to unmute yourself? Yep, I think I should be unmuted. Fantastic. Um, it's Chardulius, but everyone butchers it, so don't feel bad. Um, I'm a, a pharmacist and medical account associate director with Nova Nordisk, and um, I want to thank you for um, your review. Um, and also, I am going to respectfully yield back my uh, time today to the committee, but I wanted to be available for any questions you might have on Nova Nordisk GLP-1s. Thank you so much. Great. Any questions on the GLP-1s? All right, back to the recommendations. So we can get that slide back up. <clears throat> Sounds like we're inclined to continue to use the SGLT2 inhibitor PA criteria as proposed modifications um, for CKD and for um, non-diabetics. Anything else you want to recap on that, Kathy? No, thanks, Roger. I was just, yeah, I was just wanted to make sure that that was okay to change the, or it, add in that time frame. Um, you know, with the committee, but otherwise, yeah, we'll keep it as is. So thank you. And for the GLP-1 criteria, am, am I correct in, in reading that um, the, the currently listed preferred agents would not require uh, a PA? This, this would only be applied to the non-preferred? Right. So they have an automatic um, uh, approval process where if the, there's a history of metformin use um, in the patient's profile, it automatically goes through if it's a preferred product. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I really appreciate that. Um, I, I, um, I think it's in, in alignment with AACE and, and uh, you know, ADA standards of care um, guidelines. Um, it's, it's challenging. I mean, I, I certainly support this criteria and, and, in, and in practice, I find it challenging because it's quite different from CCO payer formularies um, that we encounter and there being a lot more criteria often there. Um, and so patients can get, you know, started on these medications through this criteria and then get assigned to a different uh, payer with a different formulary and now they don't qualify for them anymore. Um, so that's, that's just an ongoing challenge, but I, as, as it's stated here, I certainly support this, um, this criteria. Thank you. Okay, so any other discussion or edits, or are we ready <clears throat> for a motion to approve the recommendations and the amendment to the SGLT2 inhibitors as discussed? Move to approve as amended. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Abstain? Fantastic. All right, with that, we have a scheduled break. Um, I think instead of 15 minutes, if you don't mind, uh, we'll move it to 10 minutes. Uh, does that work for the committee? Fantastic. So I'm gonna start the countdown and we'll reconvene uh, in 10 minutes. So thank you very much.
All right, we're getting to the end of our break here. Recording has resumed. Make sure everybody gets back to our seats. For those of you following along in the packet posted to the website, uh, we're going to resume on page 177 in the pack. And we're going to turn it over to Deanna. So Deanna, the floor is yours. Thank you, Roger. I'm glad we had a break after Kathy's presentation because she did a, an awesome job on a really complex topic. And hopefully uh, this will be a lot easier to digest. <laughs> the reason we're bringing Dupilumab back yet again, we just reviewed it in um, June of 2022, is because if we could go to the next slide, uh, dupilumab has some more approved indications, ex expanded indications. So um, the first is the eosinophilic esophagitis in adults and pediatric patients that are 12 years and older that weigh at least 40 kilos. And then the second is um, the FDA approved uh, an uh, expanded age for dupilumab in atopic dermatitis to pediatric patients six months and older. So now dupilumab has four approved indications, atopic dermatitis, moderate to severe asthma, um, chronic rhinusitis with nasal polyps, and esophag eosinophilic esophagitis. I had never heard of eosinophilic esophagitis until I started researching this indication. Um, eosinophilic esophagitis is one of the most prevalent esophageal diseases after gastro esophageal reflux disease. And as you can imagine, the two um, have similar symptoms. Eosinophilic esophagitis is an immune-mediated disorder in which uh, eosinophils are found in the esophageal mucosa in response to various stimuli or antigens. Uh, we're starting to see an increased incidence of eosinophilic esophagitis uh, from uh, 1 to 20 new cases per 100,000 people per year. In the Oregon Medicaid patient uh, population, we have about uh, 784 patients that have this diagnosis, and that's the combined uh, coordinated care and fee-for-service populations. Next slide, please. So just to give you some background um, to help understand why we developed the PA criteria the way we did, um, before dupilumab was approved uh, by the FDA for eosinophilic esophagitis, there were no FDA approved treatments for this uh, disease. Um, there's been a lot of use of off-label use of proton pump inhibitors. Um, like I said, because the symptoms um, are difficulty swallowing. So it can be difficult unless um, the provider does a biopsy of the esophageal mucosa to see if there's eosinophils to figure out what's going on. So the off-label use of PPIs um, is a recommendation from the American Gastrologic, Gastroenterologic Association. It's based on very low quality evidence. Then the other um, off-label use is locally applying uh, cortico steroid inhaler spray to the esophagus instead of trying to put it um, into the trachea to get into the lungs you try to put it into the esophagus so that you have topical steroids which will um, help with the inflammation the two uh, products that have been looked at for this are fluticasone or budesonide now if you remember budesonide comes as a respule that has to be inserted into the inhaler in order to activate the medicine. So in the studies where they looked at budesonide, budesonide had to be compounded, uh, which uh, we don't generally, fee-for-service does not pay for compounded drugs. So I just wanted to point that out. When you look at the PA criteria, we're just going to recommend that they try either a PPI or fluticasone before advancing to uh, dupilumab. And actually it might be easier for patients to try a PPI uh, before they try uh, locally applying uh, corticosteroid with an inhaled spray that's designed for asthma. Next slide, please. So the efficacy for dupilumab uh, was studied in um, 240 adults and adolescents. The adolescents ranged in age from 12 to 17 years. There was a phase three trial that was conducted over 24 weeks. When I put this material together, the published study was not available. 
um, which was a couple months ago. Uh, but it is available now if you wanted to look at it. Um, the inclusion criteria was all the eligible subjects had to have a biopsy of their esophageal mucosa that showed that they had 15 or more intraepithelial eosinophils per high power field, which is abbreviated um, as EOS per HPF, despite uh, trying a course of PPI. And then they also had to have symptoms of dysphagia as measured by the dysphagia symptom question score. And that's a patient reported score that uh, reports how much um, difficulty they are having with swallowing. In this study, uh, the patients were split into two groups. Uh, group A, all the patients got tupilumab 300 milligrams sub-Q once a week or placebo. In group B, they got uh, the tupilumab uh, once a week or dupilumab 300 milligrams sub-Q um, every two weeks, which is the standard dosing we see for um, atopic dermatitis and some asthma patients. And they also had the placebo uh, comparator. And then the co-primary endpoints were uh, the proportion of patients who were able to reduce their esophageal intraepithelial count uh, to six or less uh, eosinophils per high power field, as well as uh, patients that were able to show a reduction in their uh, dysphagia symptoms as measured by the dysphagia symptom score. Uh, lower, lower scores indicate an improvement. It is a pretty wide scale, uh, zero to 84. So the minimal uh, clinically important difference for that is a change of 6.5 points. And I apologize, um, there's a typo on there. It should be MCID, not MICD. <laughs> Next slide, please. So um, at the time of uh, our posting, I wasn't able to put this uh, together, but this is just a summary of what the co-primary endpoint results were. So for group A and group B, <clears throat> there was a substantial reduction compared to placebo in the eosinophils per high power field, which was uh, statistically significant. And then there was also uh, the statistically significant change in the dysphagia score, which met the minimal uh, clinically important difference. Next slide, please. The adverse events were similar to what's been seen in other trials with injection site reactions being the most uh, prominent uh, adverse effect. And very few patients uh, discontinued this trial, even though it was small, only 240 patients. Next slide, please. So the recommendations are to revise the dupilumab PA criteria to reflect uh, the expanded age for treatment of moderate to severe atopic dermatitis that's not adequately controlled with topical therapies or if those therapies are not advisable for patients six months and older, and then revise the dupilumab uh, PA criteria to reflect the expanded indication for treatment of eosinophilic esophagitis in patients 12 years and older and, weigh, and who weigh at least 40 kilograms. And then also, we would need to revise our PPI criteria uh, to include eosinophilic esophagitis uh, ICD K20 as an indication for extended therapy if the patient is responding to PPI treatment. So the next slide, um, I'm just gonna highlight the biggest changes. We're going to amend uh, table two, which um, shows all the FDA approved indications for, for all the drugs that are used for um, eosinophilic asthma. Um, you can see there's, we, we keep adding to this table as we get more indications, but it's highlighted there in red, and then also change the age range for atopic dermatitis. Um, on the next slide, our, um, I thought it would be helpful to add the dosing. I thought the Gainwell pharmacist might appreciate because uh, the dosing does vary not only for adults, but because of the pediatric indications and um, eosinophilic esophagitis, I think is the most uh, frequently administered uh, use of dupilumab with the once a week. Um, I, I didn't mention that the, tw uh, the every other week uh, group um, in that phase three study did not show any um, symptom improvement. So that's why the FDA went ahead and approved a more aggressive uh, dosing regimen for eosinophilic es esophagitis. Uh, next slide, please. And so these would be the uh, requests that we would ask is, is it uh, for treatment of eosinophilic esophagitis? 
And if it was, we would like to step, have them step through proton pump therapy for at least eight weeks, and then a trial of topical administration of uh, the fluticasone inhaler. Um, like I mentioned previously, we, we did not include budesonide because it would have to be compounded and fee for service does not pay for compounded uh, prescriptions. Um, and then um, I think the last change would be on the next slide for the uh, renewal criteria to add uh, eosinophilic esophagitis to that. So um, are there any questions before we go to public comment? I'm assuming you require a biopsy for the diagnosis? Uh, yeah, I didn't put that in there, but that's a good point. <laughs> um, we could add that if you think that would be helpful. Uh, I don't know. It's redundant. That's the only way you're going to really biopsy. I will really know it because otherwise it's, it's, it's exactly. A, and and I guess it's kind of assuming that if they have the diagnosis of eosinophilic esophagitis, that they've done the biopsy. Yeah, I, but let's not make it more complicated. Let's okay. leave it as is. Okay. That's a good point, though. So yeah. here's the summary again of, of what the recommendations are. And I don't actually have a good alternative, but the fluticasone requirement feels a little clunky and that like the budesonide is like a therapeutic option, but we're not going to give them credit for it. I know we, we can't ask for that, but um, it does feel a little stringent to require the fluticasone when there are sort of like other topical steroids we use all the time. Um, the BPI makes sense. I mean, Bill's got his the, hand. The absorbable topical steroid because you don't want you don't want it systemically absorbed so flutic 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 is poorly absorbed so that's what you don't want them to use decadron or something like that that would be absorbed into the system and so the the nasal steroids fit that quite nicely and you can squirt it into your mouth and swallow it totally yeah and i mean i prescribe the oral budesonide all too often, unfortunately, but. Um, oh, you do for for um, for this condition? For GVHD, I didn't realize it had to be compounded, but. Um, well, th it. there is oral budesonide tablets that, that are used. Um, I, I think they're also approved for um, uh, Crohn's disease and um, ulcerative colitis, but that's what's unusual about this is, is you're right, it's clunky because what they were using um, is the inhaled version of the topical steroids. And like Dr. Origer said, the reason that they're not using the systemic steroids is because of the concern um, of side effects. So they were doing a topical application and it was really hard to word when I was writing up the summary. <laughs> so it's, it's corticosteroid, uh, corticosteroid therapy with topical administration of the fluticasone multidose inhaler. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, totally. I guess my only concern, it just feels like a little bit of a, just a clunky barrier to get over to get to the drug, but. Would uh, you prefer that know. they just try their proton pump? Therapy? Maybe, maybe that's like the cleanest option if nobody objects. Um, yeah, I think that would make sense to me. They're, they're both off label. Um, and, and, you know, I was just going by what I could find in terms of what's been studied. And, and there's a lot more detail um, in the packet. I, I, in the interest of time, I didn't want to go through all of that. Um, but um, I'm happy to, to modify it however the committee um, thinks is best. I would, I like the way it's written because yes, it's clunky, but it's not difficult. You know, the fluticasone inhalers are cheap and easy to use. And all you do is squirt it in your mouth and swallow it. And I don't know what the dosage is. Um, and I see this drug's use in this condition very similar to its use in asthma and atopic dermatitis. It is kind of your last thing for the small number of people that have severe, severe disease that don't respond to anything else. And we need to have it, but I think the use will be just like asthma. A very small percent of people in whom they've tried everything else and that they've failed. And we just don't have any FDA approved things in this list, but the parallels to asthma are, are pretty strong.
Okay, I have no qualms with Bill's approach. That, that sounds fine to me. Anybody else want to weigh in or are you ready for public comment? Well, we'll let you have comments after public comment. <clears throat> we have uh, Brandon Yip with Sanofi. Are you able to unmute your line? Yes, Roger, can you hear me? Hear you loud and clear. Awesome. <clears throat> And the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, my name is Brandon Yip, and I am a medical value and outcomes um, specialist for Sanofi Field Medical. And um, I support Dupilumab. And after listening to the great discussion between Bill and Deanna, you guys did a great job of highlighting a lot of my comments already. Uh, Deanna actually hit a lot of the, the um, points that I wanted to reiterate. She talked about the more frequent dosing. It is once weekly for uh, EOE and dupilumab. She talked about monthly dosing for the younger ages, uh, six months to six years. Uh, those were the two things I wanted to highlight. She went through uh, the clinical studies and uh, Bill also, also mentioned the confirmation of diagnosis through biopsies, right? And I think that one additional comment I would just like to quickly make regarding the uh, biopsies and the, the confirmation of diagnosis, right? That is the confirmation of trafficking of eosinophils, right? That is a huge biomarker for, for type 2 inflammation and just one of the underlying, you know, keys for dupilumab. And you guys can all see the number of growing indications that we have for type 2 inflammatory conditions that it's very effective in treating this underlying type 2 inflammation, right? So um, there's a lot of comorbidities um, among these patients for, um, a lot, a lot of these patients with uh, type 2 inflammation, so a lot of these studies, right, there's a lot of cross comorbidities, patients with atopic dermatitis, asthma, EOE, so, you know, seen by a lot of different specialists, right, so um, only a last comment I wanted to make um, very quickly is just uh, for proactivity for the future, right, uh, we just launched a new indication, if you guys weren't aware, on a Friday of last week for perigonodularis. It's another dermatologic condition. It affects older patients a little bit different from atopic dermatitis, but you no, know, just wanted to be available for comments or if you guys want to hear more uh, clinical information about those things, be happy to um, come back and uh, provide you with that information. Great, thanks, Brandon. Any questions for Brandon? Okay, put the recommendation back up. Deanna, turn it back to you. I think we just need a, um, if there's no further questions or discussion, is there a motion to approve the recommendation? Move, move to approve. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Abstain? Great. Recommendations we put forward to the OHA. Uh, moving on, we'll go to the ADHD um, literature scan and drug use evaluation. Uh, I think Dave Ingen's going to lead us off, and we're on page 194 in the packet. All right. Thank you, Roger. Yeah, today uh, we'll briefly review the ADHD drug class. Uh, this presentation is summarizing the main findings, as Roger mentioned. That's the re detailed reports on page one or 194. Um, you may recall uh, that we reviewed this class in June earlier this year, and we presented the findings from a DERP report. And at that meeting, we're also asked to perform some uh, follow-up on ADHD drug dosing maximums. And we'll address these findings uh, shortly in the form of a, a DUE and a PA criteria update, but more of that in a bit. Um, yeah, so just as a reminder, uh, prior reviews have found evidence to support that uh, stimulants and non-stimulants may be beneficial in ADHD treatment, and that comparisons between short and long-acting agents have uh, not demonstrated consistent differences. Uh, and lastly, there's insufficient evidence for direct comparisons in outcomes of efficacy and safety uh, based on patient demographics, comorbidities, or with concurrent medications. Um, this review, uh, next slide, please. Uh, this review did find uh, some expanded indications and a new formulation. So uh, Evicio ODT, uh, it's an amphetamine-based product, 
uh, was recently approved for use in uh, younger children, ages three to five, and it used to be six to 17 years old. Um, there was an expanded indication for Calbri, um, the scoloxine ER caps uh, for use in adults. And it's also a higher max dose for adults that we'll address in a little bit. Um, Dynavel XR, uh, which originally came out as an e ER suspension is now available as a capsule. And um, there's a once daily transdermal prep formulation of dextroamphetamine, and that's available um, under the trade name of Zelstrom. Uh, there were a few uh, FDA safety alerts to note. Um, one was just for atomoxetine as a warning for increased risk of uh, aggression and um, manic symptoms in, in all age groups. And uh, the other was for amphetamine products. Um, in general, uh, where we've seen uh, intestinal ischemia uh, added to the label as a potential adverse reaction. So uh, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Sarah. She's gonna discuss the findings on dose limits for uh, ADHD drugs. Thanks, Dave. Um, so I'm gonna talk just briefly about this short DUE that we did that was prompted by um, questions from committee members the last time we talked about this class. So the purpose of this evaluation was primarily to look at the incidence of prescribing um, above the maximum FDA approved, approved dose in the fee-for-service population. Um, so Dave went over a little bit about our current policy. So we um, allow medications, preferred medications to go through without PA if they're within usual doses age limits, um, and for recommended combinations that are typically used in clinical practice. Um, and so medications outside of those usual doses, age limits, or guideline-directed combinations require PA um, and documentation of consultation or review by a mental health provider. And so the key things that we were looking at with this evaluation were the proportion of patients that are prescribed ADHD drugs above those maximum FDA labeled doses um, and the proportion of patients, if they are prescribed high, high doses, what proportion are getting those uh, prescriptions from behavioral health specialists. Um, so the population included in this analysis uh, patients were included if they had paid fee-for-service claims for drugs in the ADHD drugs class um, from April 1st of 2021 through uh, March of 2022, so for a one-year period. Uh, patients were excluded if they had primary insurance, Medicare, or other limited Medicaid drug coverage um, because our data in those populations is likely incomplete. Um, and the index event for each patient was defined as the claim with the largest daily dose during the study period. So if patients were on multiple doses or multiple drugs, they were categorized according to the highest dose because we wanted to estimate how many patients were getting above maximum FDA-labeled doses. So looking at what we found in this study, um, just under 2% of patients had prescriptions that were higher than the FDA-labeled dose for their age. Um, you can see the breakdown of uh, patients uh, based on demographics here. Uh, most uh, patients who had above the um, FDA max dose were adults over 18 years of age. Um, and regardless of age or dose, about half of patients had prescriptions written from a behavioral health specialist. When we look at what drugs were most commonly prescribed above the maximum FDA dose, um, most commonly it was a combination of dextroamphetamine and amphetamine salts um, that were most common um, above FDA doses. And again, the proportion of specialist and non-specialist prescribing was pretty comparable to this population. When we break out what uh, prescribers are most commonly prescribing high dose um, ADHD drugs, um, these are the, the prescribers that kind of rose to the top. Um, and there wasn't a whole lot of distinction between 
um, these prescribers and prescribers um, that were prescribing ADHD meds below the FDA approved dose. So I think this is more indicative of just the, the type of practitioners that are prescribing ADHD drugs in general. Um, we see a lot of prescriptions from uh, psychiatric mental health nurse practitioners, from family medicine providers, and from pediatric physicians, um, which you'd expect with this class of medications. So just a couple limitations on this evidence. Um, there is use of the, uh, what, because we used the highest dose claim as the index event, it might overestimate patients with high dose utilization, but even using that method, um, there was overall a really small portion of patients that did have prescriptions above the FDA uh, maximum dose. Um, and patients were categorized based on a single index event. And so um, we might miss uh, uh, patients that had claims for multiple different drugs. Um, one of our previous DUEs estimated that about 7% of the population um, might have claims for multiple ADHD drugs. Um, and so that is a limitation in this data. Um, and then just in general, um, primary prescriber taxonomy um, might be incomplete or not accu accurately reflect um, the prescriber specialty. So based on this and questions that uh, came up from the committee, we did revise our PA criteria to reflect um, maximum ages and dose limits as specified in the product labeling or supported compendia. There are a lot of different dosage forms for a lot of these medications. Um, and so clarifying um, the maximum age and dose limits um, for each of the uh, individual formulations, you can see in the packet, um, that table is a lot longer than it used to be. So hopefully that provides some clarity for exact age and dose limits for the specific um, formulation that's being requested. Um, we did discuss this new PA criteria with the Mental Health Clinical Advisory Group as well. Um, and they were supportive of the recommended age and dose limits um, that are presented here. Um, one of the concerns that they had was that some medications are um, only FDA approved in um, children or up to 17 years of age. And so they had recommended that um, to, uh, you know, the best we can to avoid disruptions in care for patients that are on and stable um, on a, a medication as a child and then age out into a maximum age limit as they transition to 18 years of age. Um, so to continue therapy and minimize disruptions in those circumstances when therapy was appropriate and the patient was stable. Um, so you can see those PA changes. We added a couple questions in the criteria for those um, to address that circumstance. Um, otherwise, based on the evidence that Dave presented earlier, um, there's not any recommended PDL changes um, based on the clinical evidence, but we will be looking at cost in executive session and I'd be happy to take questions about this data or if you have questions for Dave about the evidence review. Thank you, well done. I can't resist some comments about things. You know, this is one of the few drugs on the market that's older than I am. Um, dex, dex, dextroamphetamine was first introduced as an asthma inhaler in 1935 and as a tablet in 1937. So it's, uh, tribute to creativity to have it still be patented. The patch is a spectacularly bad idea if you read the package insert. The package insert says the peak drug level occurs at six to nine hours after application of the patch, which is when you're taking it off. It also recommends putting the patch on two hours before it's needed. Then once the patch comes off, the half-life is additional 6.4 hours. I rest my case. Appreciate the comments, Bill. Move to approve. We have a second. Second. Thanks, Pat. All in favor? 
Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Abstain? Great. Thank you very much. Just wanted to confirm, uh, Dr. Ted Williams, are you back with us? I'm here. Fantastic. I'm here. A voice from the past. Uh, if you're following along in the packet, we'll be turning your attention to page 221. And the floor is yours, Ted. All right. Uh, so it's great to be back uh, at the Oregon PNT. I've got a lot of information in here and even more in the packet. So I'm only going to touch on the high points and I'm going to speak really quickly. So don't be afraid. Whoops. How about I turn my camera on? Don't be afraid to um, jump in and ask questions, or you can ask questions at the end. So without further ado, we'll just jump right into the lumetepirone DUE. And next slide. All right, so the research questions, uh, we'll advance one more to get them to pop up. So we're gonna talk about the indications we found associated with lumetepirone use, what provider specialties were associated with lumetepirone, the first lumetepirone claim, how it's used in conjunction with other psychotropic medications and the impact on overall healthcare resource utilization. Next slide. All right, so the methods, let's get into it here. Pretty basic uh, inclusion criteria. You either had a lumetepirone claim during the study period or you had a mental health clinical advisory group antipsychotic prescribed during the study period, which we are calling risperidone, paliperidone, and aripiprazole. So I'll refer to MHCAG throughout. That always refers to one of these three medications. For our cohorts, pretty straightforward. Again, if you had lumetepirone at any point during the study period, we threw you in the lumetepirone group, everybody else was in the MHCAG group. So if you had both, you were in the lumetepirone group. Moving on, our time frame, we went from April of 2019 to the end of 2021. This is because our first lumetepirone claims appeared in April of 2020, and we wanted a year of baseline data and a year of follow-up data. So this attribution table is in the study, and I wanted to address it because it's super duper busy. But the big thing, as Sarah mentioned in her DUE, most of these exclusions are for administrative reasons because we don't have all of their claims. So the, the item listed is O2 baseline TPL coverage. That means they had some sort of third party liability coverage during the baseline period. So we wouldn't have complete, we may not have complete claims for them. So we excluded them. I will draw your attention to two of the non-administrative exclusions we had, which were O1, patients under 18. We did not look at children. It was just for adults. And 07, not treatment experienced. We only looked at treatment experienced patients. So applying all those criteria, we end up at the bottom row of the table with patients remaining 51 in lumetepirone group, a little lower than we'd like, but this was a very early DUE. And um, in the MHCAG group, we had 716 patients. Now, that was a whirlwind through the methods. Any questions before we go on to the baseline period data? All right, let's go into it. So here are the baseline demographics, and I use this table format, which is a little different than Sarah's and Dave's, so I want to take a minute to walk you through it. So the left-hand column is our measures, age, gender, and the type of plan they were in. The second column is a sub-measure, so with age, we have the the at mean, median, and standard deviation for the age, as well as age bands, 18 to 29, 30 to 39, so on and so forth. The third column is the lumetepirone group, again, 51 patients and their measures. And then the fourth column, the MHCAG group and their measures. And the final column is our p-values. So if you scan down the final column of p-values, you can see that our baseline demographics are similar across the two groups. So that's really nice, and we don't have to worry so much about you know, age differences or gender differences between the two groups. So it makes them, it's nice that they're fairly comparable in these categories. Next slide. Comorbidities, it's a little bit of a different picture. So two comorbidities, I apologize, that we focused on were bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. Lumetepirone had a higher rate of schizophrenia during the baseline period than the MHCAG group, and the MHCAG group had a higher rate of bipolar disorder compared to lumetepirone. So there are some important differences in comorbidities during the baseline period between the two groups that we'll need to keep in mind as we're interpreting the results. 
astute readers will notice that there's no way any of these add up to 100%. So I added some Venn diagrams because I love Venn diagrams. On the left-hand side is the lumetepirone group. So this consists of the 51 members in lumetepirone. The red circle are the patients who had bipolar diagnosis during the baseline period, 15 of them. The green sphere on the right is the baseline schizophrenia diagnosis patients, 29 of them. And the intersection, six patients who had both bipolar and schizophrenia in the lumetepirone group during the baseline period. You'll notice that's only 75% of the lumetepirone group. So 13 patients or 25% did not have either bipolar and schizophrenia. And the great team at the Derm asked, well, what did they have? What is this being used for? Unfortunately, that's a little out of scope. We just, there were so many interesting questions that were raised. We didn't explore that any further, but just keep in mind that it's not a super clean picture of schizophrenia or bipolar or the two of them combined for comorbidities during the baseline period. Next slide. All right, so we're moving on to the follow-up period. Any questions about the baseline period before I go on? All righty. So concurrent psychotherapeutic regimens during the follow-up period. Antidepressants were more common in the MHCAG group and other antipsychotics were more common in the lumetepirone group. And so that's important. We've got a different mix of uh, medications between the two groups, but I don't wanna spend too much time on it just know, again, just like diagnoses during the baseline period were different, our concurrent psychotherapeutic regimens during the follow-up period differed between the two groups in significant ways. Now, this slide I want to slow down on because it's super busy and it's really important. So this is looking at antipsychotic persistence. What was the time from the index event to the time they, the end of their last prescription, which is the whole game with antipsychotics? We've got to get the patients to take them. So on the y-axis is the event-free probability. This is just the percentage of patients still on their antipsychotic. The x-axis is the number of days from the index date through the end of the follow-up period. The red line is the MHCAG group. The blue line is the lumetepirone group. And the shaded bands are the equal precision bands. These are just confidence intervals at each point in time. So in the upper left-hand corner, on day one, 100% of both groups are on therapy. That's by definition. And at about 30 days, we see this big drop because it looks like a lot of patients in both groups got one 30-day prescription and didn't get any more. If you look on the left-hand axis again at 0.5, that's the 50% of patients. And so that's the median time to discontinuation for each group. So lumetepirone is 114 days median time to discontinuation, and MHCAGs were 148 days. So that's about 34 days apart, but because those confidence intervals intersect through the entire time, the persistence between the two groups was not statistically different. So even though there's some differences in potentially how they're being used, what regimens are going on, overall persistence between lumetepirone and MHCAG, antipsychotics, is comparable. We don't see any st statistically significant differences in persistence. I know that was a lot and I went really fast. Any questions about that? All right, let's keep on moving. So healthcare resource utilization, because we're doing a health plan here, right? So first we're going to look at baseline costs, then follow-up costs, then the change in costs from baseline to follow-up. So here we have emergency department a small but statistically significant difference in total cost in US dollars uh, between the two groups. Inpatient costs, the MHCAG group had quite a bit higher inpatient costs and the lumetepirone group had quite a bit higher pharmacy costs. So total baseline costs are comparable between the two groups. There's no statistically significant difference during baseline for total cost of care. Going to follow-up, we have emergency department still, same pattern, small but statistically significant difference in costs. The inpatient costs even out, but pharmacy costs, huge difference, huge, huge difference. Ten, over $10,000 in lumetepirone outpatient pharmacy costs during the follow-up period versus $3,600 in the MHCAG group. But again, total cost of care, 
are not statistically significant in their difference. But when we look at the change from baseline to follow-up, we see the big picture here, which is the inpatient costs really interestingly went up in the lumetaparone group, but went down in the MHCAG group. So there's something really different about the lumetaparone group and the MHCAG group as far as the inpatient costs and access. There was a big, big change. They went down in the MHCG, MHCAG group, but went up in the lumetaparone group. And then pharmacy costs went up by $3,600 uh, on average for the lumetaparone group and just went up a little bit at $762 for the MHCAG group. But now we see the big difference in the total cost of care. $8,000 increase in lumetaparone versus a decrease of almost $700 in the MHCAG group. So the lumetaparone group had a much higher average cost of care overall for inpatient costs and for pharmacy costs co uh, compared to MHCAG. So again, super big table, lots of data, questions about this. All right, keep on trucking. So this next section, we want to look at prescriber patterns. And here we have different inclusion criteria. So that giant table I mentioned earlier where we excluded people because they didn't have enough baseline data or enough follow-up data, we actually included them in this part of the study because we wanted to focus in on prescriber characteristics on the index date. So we didn't care how many prescriptions they got or what baseline diagnosis they might have had. We just wanted to focus on the provider's location and specialty. So that's what we'll get into now. So this is an abbreviated table. This does not list all of the Oregon counties, but we did this analysis for all the Oregon counties. And the first two rows really illustrate the big idea of initial prescriber county. Multnomah County, the percentages are fairly similar. Lumetepirone, just under 21% of all lumetepirone prescriptions were for providers listed as in Multnomah County were 25.5% for the MHCAG group. But Douglas, 16.4% of lumetaparone prescriptions were initiated by providers from Douglas County compared to just 3.75% of MHCAG uh, prescriptions. And there's other differences in some of the rural counties. And so I, I don't wanna focus so much on the particulars of that, but to point out that there is some ge there are some geographic prescribing pattern differences. And this, this fits in, I think, with the, the finding that inpatient costs were really different between these two groups before and um, change from baseline to follow. So there's, there's something going on in broader prescriber patterns, uh, not necessarily because of lumetepirone, but there's, there's definitely a difference. Let's move on to the next one. So we also looked at the initial prescriber specialty. Again, this is a short, um, an abbreviated table. We're only including prescriber specialties where they had at least four lumetaparone patients. And the second row tells the big story here. Psychiatric mental health nurse practitioners prescribed almost 73% of lumetaparone, but only 33% of MHCAG. So we see that there's a really there's much higher percentage of psychiatric mental health nurse practitioners prescribing lumetaparone than these other medications. So is that tied into the geography as well? Very possibly, but there's definitely prescribing practice differences going on. Uh, let's move to the next one. So in conclusions, you can click one more time so they pop up. Uh, significantly higher rates of schizophrenia in the lumetaparone group. Big geographic differences with Douglas County accounting for the biggest difference between those groups. Lumetepirone also has a higher rate of other antipsychotic use. And even though the time to discontinuation is very similar between the two groups, lumetepirone patients had a much higher increase in cost in inpatient services, pharmacy services, and total cost of care from baseline to follow-up. So given all of this, we don't because the numbers were so small and we didn't see egregious misuses of lumetaparone, we don't think there's a need for a strong utilization control, any sort of uh, safety edits on these. That doesn't seem warranted, but we, we are adding lumetaparone to our queue of potential um, 
educational outreach projects because it would be interesting to talk to providers and find out what these differences might be, provide the education on the costs of these medications and really find out what's going on that's different because that could prov um, provide us with information, not just about lumetaparone, but um, mental health prescribing in general. So that's a whirlwind. I tried to keep it at time and I'd like to open it up for additional questions. And it looks like I've got somebody in the chat here. Oh, never mind. Thank you, well done. Good job, Ted. Questions for Ted? That's super interesting. It definitely seems like targeted outreach um, makes a lot of sense in an academic detailing sort of way. Definitely, there's there's a, a lot of opportunities there. Great. We do not have any public comment. So I guess the recommendation, which is, I don't know if it's a formal recommendation to the OHA, is uh, no change to the utilization controls are warranted, but to consider outreach for providers uh, and provider education to raise awareness. Sounds like the committee's all in favor, so. Move to approve. Thank you, Bill. Second? Second. Great, thank you, Karen. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone abstain? I am just curious what would make the difference between turning it into a utilization control issue versus just an educational issue. Great question. Uh, because this is a carve out medication, there are some very particular restrictions on what we can and can't do. So we have to be careful there. Uh, we couldn't stop it just to drive utilization to some other agent. But if we had valid reasons to implement some kind of safety concerns or utilization controls, that's permissible. All right. We're down to our final topic. Uh, draw your attention to page 232 in the packet. We have a uh, Anavera um, pro proposal, and we'll turn it over to Sarah Fletcher. Thanks, and um, Sarah, can you switch over to the packet screen as well? Um, just to get started, this is uh, this will be very short as well. It's a prior authorization or a quantity limit that we'd like to propose for a drug called Anavira. Um, it's a month, or it's a yearly contraceptive ring product that's used for three weeks and then removed for one week, similar to the monthly products, but the same ring is reused for up to 13 cycles. And because of some um, identified waste associated with confusion between these two products, we wanted to implement a quantity limit. Um, the recommendation that we have, if you'll go up to the previous page, um, we'd like to implement a coding audit for a minimum of 300 days. And that's kind of a backdoor way of making sure the day supply is long enough, even though our system won't allow for a day supply to be entered in that particular way, to try to stop prescriptions from being entered incorrectly on the front end. And then if a patient happens to lose one or there's some confusion, um, they can get a point of sale override for a first refill, but we'd like to then implement the quantity limit that's on page 233 uh, if a second refill within 12 months is requested. So that would be the third total fill. And that would uh, go back to the prescriber to attest that the patient's been appropriately counseled and hopefully reevaluate as well if this is the most appropriate product for them. Um, so it's, it's mostly just a quantity limit to ensure that the product is being used correctly and to avoid any further waste. Are there any questions I can answer? And the recommendation is just to approve the, the quantity limit as written. Move to approve. Thank you. Second. Great. Everybody in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? And I don't think anybody's abstaining. Well, fantastic. We uh, have got through the agenda. I need to read a short blurb, as you're all aware, before we go into an executive session where we'll review confidential pricing. Um, 
we won't make any decisions there. We'll come back out to open session before we make any recommendations. So with that, the PMT committee will now meet in executive session for the purpose of consideration or informational records that are exempt from disclosure by law. Executive session is held pursuant to RS 192-6602F and ORS 414-3561 and 2, which allows the committee to meet in executive session to discuss reviewing confidential drug pricing, including substantial cost differences between drugs within the same therapeutic class. It's necessary for the committee to make final recommendations or to comply with the requirements of ORS 414-353. Representatives of the news media and designated staff shall be allowed to attend the executive session. All other members of the audience will not be per permitted to attend the session. Representatives of the news media are specifically directed not to report on any of the deliberations during the executive session except to state the general subject of the session as previously announced. No decision may be made in executive session and at the end of the executive session, we will return to open session. So with that, Sarah is gonna work to get us into the breakout room. Great, yes. And I am going to be pausing the recording while we go there. All right, we're returning from the executive session. Just want to make the head count here and make sure that we have, I know one of the committee members looks like they had to leave, but so that we have a quorum for taking action and make sure that everybody is still recognizes the co-host for muting. Um, let's see. One. Two, three, four, five. Roger, um, Tim is at the bottom. You can make him a co host. Yeah, I am not the host right now. So I don't if who is I think you still are, or if I need to try to reclaim that, I'm trying to let him be a co-host as well. Can you hear me? Gotcha, Tim. Can you hear us? Yep, I'm here. Thank you. Fantastic. Nope. No, then we have a quorum. So appreciate your patience and letting us get back in there. So we have concluded reviewing confidential pricing in executive session. I'm gonna read off all the recommendations from executive session for the committee and we can take uh, one final vote. So after reviewing executive session for the Tim's DERP summary, the recommendation is to make no changes to the PDL. For the colony stimulating factors, that's the lit scan. The recommendation is to make Granix uh, non-preferred for the anti-epileptic drug class update, recommendation is to make Nasalam, which is my Nasalam nasal spray, and Veltoco diazepam spray, both preferred. For the multiple sclerosis class update, the recommendation is to make PEG interferon, those Plegardy, the two dose forms, preferred. And for the GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT-2 inhibitors, recommendation is no changes to the PDL are recommended. And for the ADHD literature scan, uh, the recommendation is to make Calbri, Luxazine, preferred. So that, any questions, edits, or we'll entertain a motion to approve. Move to approve. Second. Thank you, Bill and Karen. I'll do a second if needed. That will take it. Thanks, Tim. So that, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And any abstain? Well, that concludes our October meeting. I appreciate everyone's uh, patience with us. We got done about 15 minutes early, but the next P&T meeting will be held December 1st. Again, thank you all very much and stay safe. Have a nice evening, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.